Uh, that we're all ready to go for the uh, afternoon session here. Uh, I'll plan on going until about 5 p.m. Hopefully, I can stay within those parameters, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, we'll take, we'll do an extended question and answer session. With whoever wants to remain and ask questions, and I'll keep asking questions for as long as you have them, or for as long as we're allowed to stay in the room. How's that sound? All right. New age deception number six: evil is necessary. This is a huge one, and it's one that unfortunately is gaining a lot more ground in this movement. Um, they insist that you know evil must be present; it must continue. It is something that is required; it is necessary because, hey, without the darkness. There can't be light. There can't exist in light. And it's again, it's, a, it's another very imbalanced justify, a justification. It's something that is there to justify what is going on in our world and get people to accept it, to stand down from taking any action that will create real and positive change and get them to stand down from doing that work. Okay? Um, so it's it's a big mind control technique for people to believe that a, an extreme imbalance, which is what evil really is, is actually required. And what this is is a twisting of a natural law that is about balance and rhythm. This comes from a perversion of what I would call, and what many teachers have called, the law of rhythm, or the law of compensation. And that does have to do with polarity. A, 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 a shifting of energy, a blending of energy, which I'm going to get into. But this concept that evil is necessary is a perversion and an extreme imbalanced variant of that original teaching about um, rhythm and compensation. So this also justifies behaviors like, well, I'll just go out and pick the lesser of two evils, when really evil works for the same cause, the same goals, it's on the same side. There is no such thing as the lesser of two evils. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a myth and a joke in and of itself in its own right. Evil is evil. Okay, there, there, there's no, you know, shades of evil or, you know, different flavors of it. If it's about control, if it's about keeping people down from where they really want to go in consciousness, if it's anti-freedom, it's evil. And, you know, when you try to pick between the lesser of two evils, you get more evil. You know? It's like saying, what flavor of slavery would you like to endure? You know? Well, there's no such thing as just a little bit of slavery. Okay? Like, there's no such thing as just a little bit of evil. It's either evil or it's not evil. Okay? So, this idea that there's, you know, different flavors of evil or, you know, different extremes, it's one polarity. Okay? And it doesn't need to exist in this level of imbalance. This teaching is ultimately bullshit and should be rejected. Evil is not necessary, and we shouldn't tolerate it. You know, toler toler the toleration of evil is not an enlightened position, regardless of what some New Age teachers will tell you. No one should be tolerant of evil. Okay? That's called stupidity. That's called uh, not having enough self-respect to understand you shouldn't be a subject or a slave of evil. And actually having enough uh, self-respect to understand that you should be involved in the battle against evil to help to eradicate it. Evil should never be tolerated. And again, this comes from a couple of false teachings and false understandings that are unfortunately propagated. One of them is a false notion of polarity. Now, polarity does exist in the world. It's not an illusion, okay? There are different sides to things. There are different extremes. There are different uh, polar aspects. But when you really dig deep into polarity... Yes, at some level, at some unified level of consciousness, it's one thing. And then there's just extremes between those one thing. Again, this is what the law of rhythm and compensation discuss in uh, some deeper level spiritual teachings. So, <clears throat> here we see what people would consider polarities within consciousness. Yang or masculine energy, yin or feminine energy. 
they've been described as uh, solar and lunar, uh, active and passive, analytical versus intuitive, dominant versus submissive, left brain and right brain. And we've already touched on this in the section on consciousness toward the beginning of this seminar. So what I'm trying to emphasize and get across here is that for these polarities to exist doesn't mean that we have to go into uh, and for them to be balanced in our lives. We shouldn't place one set as more highly uh, treasured or important than the other. We need all of these dynamics in our life in a blend, a balanced blend. Okay, But it doesn't mean you go into one polarity and just stay there in a total extreme. That's what tolerance of evil would be like. Or even saying evil must exist. It must be necessary for us to know what goodness is all about. It doesn't work like that. Okay, This is the imbalance to this teaching regarding polarity. And it, it requires discernment to understand how this is a deception. All right? For us to understand what good behavior is and for what orderly conditions in our lives are doesn't mean we have to experience the depth of evil. Okay? Only again, only a people that are self-loathing and don't have a truly developed, a truly developed deep sense of self-respect and self-love would say, I need to experience total evil and know what goodness is. Okay? So this false notion of polarity is what's getting propagated to keep this uh, new age deception in place. So part of this correction is also we have to understand how this has been propagated through a false notion of karma as well. You know, part of the idea evil is necessary, New Agers will say, well, maybe that person did something in a past life. You know, maybe they're just being paid back for something they did there. So, you know, you see this in the Hindu caste system, actually, as well. They'll say, whatever happens to people who are low on the totem pole of society, ignore it and let it go on. Let it continue. Let all those injustices and iniquities, just let them continue because that's how karma works. And this is a cop-out for ignoring evil and allowing it to continue unchecked in our lives and to run amok in our lives. It's a cop-out for not getting involved and doing something to right it and to bring it to balance. Right? When the child gets abused, Okay, that's not karmic debt being piled onto the child's uh, karmic checklist. Okay, that's somebody engaged in evil behavior that they have no right to engage in. All right, and that's what people need to understand, and that's where this deception comes from about evil being necessary. This propagated notion of how karma works in the world. No, how karma works is through natural law. It means you behave immorally and your, yourself and your society become more enslaved as more people behave like that. You behave morally and, and you propagate the, the understanding of true morality and yourself and your society become more free and orderly. That's how karma works. In the aggregate. Not on just an individual level, but on a whole societal level. So the last part of this correction is helping people to understand where this deception came from is through a dismissal of free will, which this could be a deception in and of itself. Okay, The notion that there's no such thing as free will, again, is a hallmark of right-brained imbalance. You think about it. Who are the people who most dismiss the notion of free will? Extreme religionists. Isn't that the case? You know? <coughs> It isn't the left brain folks who don't think that people have free will. It's the right brain imbalance folks out there who think there's no such thing as free will because God makes every single event in creation happen. And it's all preordained. That's a religious notion, of the dismissal of free will. And I'm telling you uh, firsthand, people who I consider friends, actually, have come up to me who are very new agey in their world view and have looked me dead in the eyes and said there is no such thing as free will. We are not ultimately responsible for our behavior because free will does not exist. And I said, you know what that is? Right to the person. That's a cop-out. And it's a refusal to accept personal responsibility for your own actions. And I would look anybody in, in the eyes, right in the eyes, and say that right to their face. 
Okay, this notion that there's no such thing as free will is a complete deception, and it's part of the tolerance for evil deception that is propagated by the New Age community. We're not automaton robots or puppets on strings. We have the ability to choose what behaviors we will engage in and what behaviors we will not engage in. Short of automated body functions like breathing, okay? Obviously, you don't have free will. Well, actually, you do, because you could off yourself and you don't have to continue to breathe. But, you know, I'm talking about behaviors that you engage toward other people. You're fully in control of those things. People want to insist that they're not, because they're always trying to cop out on their personal responsibility. We are responsible for how we behave to others at all times, at all places, no matter how much mind control or nonsense anybody has taken into themselves. That's still ultimately our responsibility. And that's something many people do not want to hear. So that's the reason that this deception is so prevalent within the New Age community, because many of the New Agers have also bought onto the notion that there's no such thing as free will. And again, another hallmark of extreme right brain or feminine consciousness imbalance without the, the rooting or the anchoring of the sacred masculine. Only evil itself would ever try to convince anyone that its existence is necessary. The idea that evil is necessary is nothing more than a coward's justification for sitting back and doing nothing in the face of evil and just allowing it to run amok in the world. And you know what happens to cowards? Cowards get cold at some point. Cowards, that are, that this is an, a farm animal. That's what a cow is. And they're led to slaughter. And the first part of the word cow is cow. An animal that's ultimately going to be led to slaughter. Without conscience and courage, that's where humanity is heading to, unfortunately. Unless we wake up and really do something to change it quickly. Evil is not necessary, ladies and gentlemen. Evil is a choice. It is a conscious choice not only to engage in it, but to tolerate it and to allow it to run amok unchecked in our lives in this world. I know that very few people want to hear that, but again, I'm not up here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm up here to tell you the truth. New Age Deception number seven. And we're going to stay on this one for a bit because this is probably the centerpiece of the whole seminar. In all honesty, this is the biggest, aside from ignoring the negative, this is the biggest deception of the whole New Age movement. Accept, 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 but never resist. And I'm going to go through five aspects of this deception and then correct each aspect. That's how complicated, it's not complicated, that's how multifaceted this particular deception is. And it's probably the most ingrained and the most deeply rooted of the New Age deceptions. <laughs> because this is what, we really think about it, we could define the New Age community or the New Age religion. In a nutshell, it is accept everything. Don't rebel. Don't rebel. That's two, the two words that you could define as the absolute defining hallmarks of the whole New Age religion. Never rebel. Okay? Because the rebellion involves confrontation. Rebellion involves that little magic two-letter word. No. The most powerful word in the universe, which we're going to get to in this section. Okay? So, you know, we have uh, Bush and Cheney as the board. Uh, people are, are familiar with Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm kind of a big fan as well. Uh, of all the Star Trek series, really, but uh, TNG in particular. And uh, I'll leave in an out later and have Obama as a board in the future slide. <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, they're telling you resistance is futile for people who don't know this reference. The Borg is an advanced collective uh, alien species that goes along out in the galaxy and they assimilate all other races to service their own uh, technologically based culture. 
They're like a beehive that roams the universe and takes everybody into the hive mind. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what the Borg are, and they're dressed as a Borg, uh, Bush and Cheney there. So let's look at some aspects of this deception. And again, this is the defining hallmark of the whole movement, which is about getting people to stand down. I like to call the New Age religion the religion of standing down. And that's the dynamic that is all about the suppression of the masculine instinct and the masculine energy. Okay? So the first part of this deception or aspect of it is the abuse, the abuse of meditation and yoga. Now, this is not a blanket statement and me telling you all forms of meditation and yoga are bad because they should be practiced. There are many beneficial qualities to meditation and yoga, many different aspects of them as well. I'm not here to specifically break down all different kinds of meditation and yoga. I want to talk about how the New Age community is using these spiritual practices in a non-spiritual way. And then I want to offer insight into what the actual correct overall usages of these practices really for in the correction section. Okay? Let's start with how the New Age movement is currently getting people to use these practices. The New Age movement has been twisting these spiritual practices into means to take people's minds off of the fact that we have been enslaved and to make it easier for people just to accept their current situation, their current condition of the, and the condition of the world as their lot in life. So again, they're using these practices to get people to say, this is just the way things are, and it's the way things must be and will always be, and we need to accept it and stop thinking about rebelling against that which is, and slavery is just that which is. See, that, that's never spoken like that, but that's the implication. You know, Not really being free and having evil run this planet is just the way that it is, eternally. So what, what we can do is we can make ourselves calm about that through the abuse of meditation and yoga. You know, it's all about keep calm and stand down. Don't actually do anything to create real change. Okay? Just do this so you can deal better with your slave job. So you can deal better with the conditions of injustice that are all around us. You know? And it's a complete abuse. There's a correct use, and then there's an abuse, as can be done with any practice. That's the first part of the, the deception of never resist. Accept everything, never resist. The second part, don't ever react to anything. This is a big uh, thing that is taught in New Age circles. Only observe, never react. Okay? So what this really translates to, it doesn't... See, when they say never react, they're not really meaning don't react. They're saying the words don't react because people hear that, you know, as, well, we shouldn't be in reactive mode. But really what they mean is don't act. That's how it comes across in the translation in most people's minds. Telling somebody you should only be an observer of what's going on and never actually be involved. Ladies and gentlemen, life's not a movie that's playing on a screen in your mind. It's actually happening. There are real objective realities that are occurring. You're not an observer of a movie called life. Okay? What that is, is a coward's way of living life. Never being actively engaged in something. All right? So they say, never try to take any action to try to change the things that are wrong with this world. Again, I heard a New Ager say the other day on some radio show that I was listening to on an alternative media show, you're not here to change the world. You're here to be changed by the world. Well, I won't deny the part, yeah, we are here to be changed by this world, but then we're here to get involved and change it by an act of our will. You know, and anybody that doesn't think that, you know, they're, they're wrapped up in an illusion. You know, we are here to change this place. And the thing we are here to change and end is slavery. That's what the spiritual warriors of this world came here to do. And 95 to 98 percent of them got knocked off their course. They got knocked off their mission as a spiritual warrior. 
because they totally went into a state of total feminine imbalance. And I'm not attacking the sacred feminine. That is the non-aggression principle and is the, one of the most important aspects of natural law to know deeply and understand and live in your life. But if you throw out the masculine, the masculine force, the principles of self-defense, and the principles of using willpower to create real change, you're not understanding anything. You know, you're in a state of imbalance and that is keeping you in the prison. So what this really translates to, folks, it doesn't mean don't react. That's what they're saying. But what the real message underneath is, is don't act. Don't act. You know, throw out the masculine component of consciousness. It's all about thoughts and emotions, thoughts and emotions, thoughts and emotions. Well, where's the third component of consciousness, which is the child, the sacred child, the byproduct of thoughts and emotions, which is our behavior, our actions in the world? Where, where's that in the New Age movement? Hardly ever even talked about. The third aspect of this deception is this, this mantra that is repeated by rote as if it's some, you know, uh, thing that's being played back on a broken record. What you resist persists. What you resist persists. Okay? And it's that the New Agers have a 100% flawed understanding of this concept, which I'm going to clarify. And again, it, it says one thing, but then it translates into something else by most of the people who hear this mantra. And here's what it translates to. And there's Obama as the Borg, okay? Saying freedom's irrelevant, con the Constitution's irrelevant, your culture will adapt to service us, surrender all your weapons, and resistance is futile, okay? Um, great internet meme there, which essentially uh, encapsulates what all government is telling people. But uh, regardless of what side of the aisle, you know, they came from. What the adage or the mantra, what you resist persists, translates to in most New Agers' minds is don't resist evil. Don't resist anything that's wrong. Just let it run rampant and destroy everything that's good. Certainly don't try to create real change here because after all, you're not here to change the world. You know, keep believing that. The last and perhaps most important dynamic of this is it's all about no confrontation. You should never call out anybody else on their bullshit because that's confrontative and combative. You know? That creates an uncomfortable situation. It doesn't matter how evil this person's actions are. Never confront people on their nonsense. You know? And God forbid try to change their perspective on what they're currently doing. No, that's not your business, the New Age community would have you believe. No, no, that's not your business to try to influence somebody else. If you know what's right and what they're doing is the exact opposite of what's right, no, 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 you say nothing. You just let that go unchallenged, unchecked. Because see, it's about no courage. No courage to get up in someone else his face and tell them definitively I do know the difference between right and wrong behavior and what you're engaged in is wrong. That's it. We don't want to be in that position. Most of us anyway. Most of us don't have the courage to do that. And the New Age movement is propagating that absence of courage. They'll say, they'll tell people there's never a time to use physical force. That, that that doesn't exist. That that could never be a right. And I would tell you, there's a huge difference between force and violence. And there's never a place for violence. But is there a place for the defensive use of physical force? You damn well better believe there is. Know that there is. And there is going to come a time when if we don't reverse the trend that's going on mentally, that's going to be required, unfortunately. And I look at that as a failure, and what I'm trying to do is prevent that time from arriving. All my work is about the prevention of that possible necessity. Okay? So, we put all these aspects of this deception together, and what we really come up with is a big pile of holes. You know, 
because that's what this whole thing about not resisting what's wrong with this world is about. Let's correct this. Let's, let's correct this once and for all, because like I said, this is one of the deepest, darkest aspects of this deception, is to just accept everything. Regarding acceptance versus change, there's a prayer that is often used in the 12-step programs, okay, trying to get people off of addictions, right? It's by Reinhold Niebuhr, and it's very powerful. Unfortunately, it is also completely misquoted. And what a lot of these 12-step programs are teaching people is a watered-down variant of the original prayer of serenity by Niebuhr, okay? So... How it's worded, let me see if I can get the wording that they use in the 12-step programs. They say, uh, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot, I cannot change, uh, to uh, the um, uh, courage to change the things I can change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay? Now, you'll notice the word I is used twice in that prayer, where you will not find the word I in this original variant of the prayer. Okay? Because again, what they're doing is they're trying to take it down from a high, very high level spiritual concept to an ego-based thing about what you can do in your own little surroundings. Okay? Well, that's not the intention of this original prayer of serenity. It is about making a very conscious delineation, a discernment between that which can be changed and that which can not be changed, that which is immutable. Okay? So let's look at this prayer in its original so we can understand what's really being said there versus what people think. And this is, is teaching in a very important aspect of acceptance versus using willpower to create change. Alright? The original wording of this prayer of serenity is, God, grant me the grace, grant me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. See, the word I is not in there, folks. The things that cannot be changed, meaning set in stone as natural law, as principles by which the universe is governed. Okay, that's what you cannot change. That's what I cannot change. That's what no one can change. The courage to change the things which, and here's another big New Age no-no, we're using the word should. Ooh, how dare we? No? I, had, I had a New Ager once say, Mark, you should never tell another human being, you should. Just think about that for a minute. Think about what they just said. Right? Think about the contradiction right there. Mark, you should never say to another person, you should. Imagine that. A New Ager said that right to my face once. I almost laughed him out of the room. Okay? Of course you should say you should to people if you know what's right and they're doing something that's not. So, the serenity to accept things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other, to distinguish that which cannot be changed versus that which should be changed because it is currently existing in a state of moral wrongness. That's what should be changed. And that's what is within our capacity to change because we do have free will. Uh, so uh, this has been shortened or abbreviated as accept what you can't change, which I think is good advice. You'll be banging your head against the wall trying to change something that cannot be changed. And change what you can't accept. Or maybe it should be change what you shouldn't accept. Okay? You should be resisting evil. You should be trying to change the conditions of this world. You should... Uh, there's the I broke the cardinal rule of the New Age movement. <laughs> okay? The proper usage of meditation and yoga. Is there a correct usage? Should people be studying these practices? Absolutely. But how they're being used is altogether different from the original intent of these practices. Okay? 
Meditation's correct usage is for balancing the brain. But specifically, it is for balancing a chronically left brain imbalanced brain. Meditation is one of the three modalities of human thought. A lot of people don't think of meditation as thought, but it is. It is a usage of the mind. And it's all about bringing it to the middle. The very word meditation comes from the Latin medi, which means the middle. It means to take or to carry to the middle. And when you are in a chronic state of left brain dominance, using medita meditation as a practice for balance will bring the consciousness to the middle. And if it's not abused, if it's not abused, it won't bring it all the way into right brain imbalance. It will keep it in the middle, balanced. So very, very left brain individuals, control freaks, scientism followers, etc., would benefit from the proper usage of meditation because that's what its actual intent, intended usage is for. The other two modes of thought are concentration. Now, that's for the opposite kind of brain imbalance. New Agers should engage in this mo modality because they're chronically in a state of right brain hemispherical imbalance in the physiology of the brain. Concentration also means to take it to the middle. Con, together, centra, at the middle. When you concentrate and use concentrated practices, you are bringing a right brain imbalance to the middle. And the third modality is contemplation, which is an active form of meditation, which we commonly refer to as daydreaming. And that's why it's so vehemently discouraged to young people, because they want you in one state of imbalance or the other so you can be controlled. So daydreaming is completely discouraged because it keeps the brain in a balanced state. Visualization, you might call it. Okay? It's actively using the left brain to form imagery and actively using the right brain to play with that imagery in a creative way. So that's the lost mode of human thought. In many mystery traditions, they've taught the all-important role of contemplation. Think about the word, contemplal, temple. At the temple together. Well, what's in the temple? This is the temple right here. Okay? The, the ancients called the brain the temple of Solomon, the temple of the sun and the moon. Well, the sun is the solar, masculine, left brain, and the moon is the lunar, feminine, right brain. The temple of Solomon is within us all. You know? That's why it's in a state of disarray and needs to be rebuilt. It's not about a physical temple. It's not about a physical structure, a physical building. The temple of Solomon, the sun and the moon is inside each one of us. Now, unfortunately, like I said, it's in total ruins in most people. And it does need to be rebuilt with strength. So that's what meditation is for. Yoga, a, a very uh, you know, diverse series of, of practices, uh, is about action. And its proper usage is to help us to discover through using the body and building the body as well, okay? And also looking deeply into ourselves and understanding what our work is to do. And then going out and doing it, not just talking about it, not just saying I'm gonna uh, strengthen my physical body and, and exercise through these forms, but to actually get you motivated so you're in shape to go out and do what you need to do, to take the action you need to take. That's the proper usage of yoga in a balanced perspective, not to get you in shape so you could be a, a good slave at your uh, you know minimum wage job that you can't stand. Okay, that's not what yoga is for. Yoga is not just about looking good, trying to tone the body. There, there are side benefits of this practice. It's not the original intent of the practice. Okay, these have been watered down to a point where not only they're not even being used for the correct usages, they they're being abused and being used for things that they were never intended to be used for. And those things are to get people to stand down and remain calm in the face of out of control evil. Or all around us. And that is not spiritual at all. That's the antithesis of a spiritual practice. Because these are being these practices are unfortunately being used and propagated by the dark side. 
And I, again, I don't tell anybody not to look into them, study, and practice them. But it has to be a balanced approach. And it has to be for the original intended usage in a true spiritual capacity, not a pseudo feel good so called spiritual capacity. Once again, everything in this section is about the dismissal of the third and all important modality of consciousness or expression of consciousness which is the masculine child action. See we can look at this as the trinity that exists within us all. We are the trinity. Okay? We have our thoughts which is are the creative aspect of the consciousness and you, we call this mind or the psyche, right? We have the spiritual component which is our emotional makeup the spirit in which we take actions, okay? And then when those two combine, with the, the, you know, there's not actual manifested a manifested reality until you know the thoughts and the emotions get processed through behavior. That's when manifested reality occurs in the world. We're taking an action based on what we've come to know and how we feel. And the goal is not to have contradiction between those three. That's what real unity consciousness is. It's not believing everything's one and it's all the same and there's no such thing as a difference between good and evil or a difference between the levels of consciousness of all the different individuated people in the world. Unity consciousness means there's no contradiction between what you think, how you feel, and how you act in the world. That's unity consciousness. And mo most New Agers will never even touch that. They'll never even tell you that. Because they don't know it themselves. Because they're not being taught that that's what unity consciousness is. So again, this is the Father, where, where, where you know, it weds with the sacred feminine of the spiritual emotional aspect, and then they, they produce a male child. That's why the trinity of every ancient culture, regardless of whether it was the Babylonian trinity, the Egyptian trinity, the Christian trinity, it was always three, a father, a mother, and a male child. Because the male child is actions, the, the offspring of the thoughts and the emotions. And what the New Age deception of accept everything, don't actually take action to change it, is, is killing is the sacred masculine child of right action in the world. Again, hence the subtitle or the addendum title to this presentation. It's New Age Bullshit and the Suppression of the Sacred Masculine Action to get people to stand down and not take right action. See, the correction to that which you resist persists, that's an incorrect variant of an ancient teaching. Okay? The wording of this teaching is something similar to this. That which is manifesting, currently manifesting, as a result, as a direct result of what you have been wrongly resisting, namely truth and right action and courage to change things, is what will continue to persist in your life. That's the real law of attraction. Not this nonsense variant of the law of attraction that's all ego and materialism based that's helping talk but in new age circles. That's the real law of attraction right there. That which is currently manifesting as a direct result of what you and your whole society has been wrongly resisting, has remained wrongly resistant to those truths, okay, and taking right action in a state of courage and willpower in the world to change things for the better. That's what you've been resisting. So you get more of what you've been getting. That continues to persist. That is the real original teaching. Not what you resist persists. It's a truncation. It's a bastardization of the real teaching. Okay? Uh, I put here a you know, locomotive. I call it the natural law express. And that's what we have to understand as the real laws of attraction. All right, And this guy thinks he's going to combat the will of creation with his bare hand. Like trying to stop a train coming out at 200 miles an hour on the tracks. I'll just stick my hand up and I'm, I'm taking this force down. Well, see how, that, how well that goes. Because the laws of nature aren't slowing down for you. 
They're at work at all times and places, whether you understand them or not, whether you accept them or not, whether you are resistant to them or not. And you're going to get a specific set of results when you understand them and live in harmony with them, and you're going to get a completely con uh, opposing set of results when you ignore them and don't and live in opposition to them. So my my the best uh, advice I could give to you is don't be this guy. If things are not going to work out well for him <laughs> or anybody else who uh, you know mimics his behavior. All right. Uh, the next part of the correction to this uh, deception of standing down, never taking action, never resist, never rebel, accept everything, is New Agers who think like this have what I call halfway understanding. And there's two major philosophical tenets or pillars that need to be deeply integrated and deeply understood for someone to consider themselves enlightened or even partially enlightened. All right? It's a very different notion of enlightenment as what is talked about in New Age circles, which is some seemingly unattainable state of being perfect. Enlightenment's not about being perfect, folks. I am enlightened and will state that I am enlightened. That has nothing to do with perfection. As long as I'm in the physical world, I'm not perfect. Okay? When you are out of this place and you go rejoin with Source at some point, you'll be perfect then. You're not perfect now. No one is. No one is perfect. You're expecting perfection while in physical incarnation, you're expecting what never was and never will be. Okay? It's a, that perfection is a pipe dream in the physical world. All right? That's the realm of pure potential and pure spirit. That's where perfection exists. Here, on the ground, in the real world, okay, we're trying to uh, you know, aspire to that, but nobody's going to be perfect in everything they do. All right? That's not what enlightenment is. Enlightenment is about knowing what's going on. Enlightenment is about being conscious of your surroundings, of what is taking place in reality. Again, consciousness, the ability to perceive and re recognize and perceive patterns accurately with respect to what's going on both within you and in your environment. Okay, Enlightenment contains two basic tenets or principles, real enlightenment. And again, this is why there's always these two seemingly opposing dualities, okay, which at first glance may seem opposites, but in fact they come together to form a synthesis. And if that synthesis is not there, there's no balance. Okay? You gotta look at it like these pillars come together to form a royal arch, which is like the strongest, the strongest uh, structure in architecture. Okay? They're seemingly opposing forces, but they create a synthesis that is the strongest force that can be made. All right? The first uh, tenet or pillar of enlightenment is the sacred feminine principle. The sacred feminine principle is the principle of non-aggression. Some people just shorten it to NAP, the non-aggression principle. Okay? Which I think every person should strive to live in every moment of their lives. Alright? That means don't initiate violence against your fellow human being. Period. The initiation of violence is always wrong. The end. We talked about this in the right versus wrong section. Unfortunately, the New Age community does understand this principle very well, actually. And again, to clarify, there are many things the New Age movement has right and is our teaching that are accurate. Uh, again, I'm not trying to give people a blanket statement that it's all bad or all wrong. As in the aggregate, as a whole, they are propagating a lot of deceptions. And, and as the, the, the whole community is comprising a religion, as a whole, because of swallowing all of those deceptions without discernment, uh, what the people who are ascribing themselves and identifying with that religion are doing is actually holding themselves back from going all the way to truth, unfortunately. So again, it's not a blanket statement that everything this movement teaches is wrong or bad. I, I've never said that. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of good material in the New Age movement. But, while they do understand the non-aggression principle well, most, and I won't say all, but the vast majority of the New Age community does not understand the second pillar of enlightenment. 
and that is the sacred masculine principle of self-defense, of the right, the inherent right to use force in a defensive capacity when we are being accosted by violent behavior or we are under the threat of violent behavior, which is the state known as duress. And we are living under duress right now, each one of us. I live under duress. You live under duress. It doesn't matter whether you know that you do. It doesn't matter whether you understand that you do. You live under duress. You are continuously threatened with violence if you do not comply to the control system. The condition of humanity is a condition of life under duress, which is tantamount to slavery, without the physical chains and shackles. It's a free-range farm, and the farmer is saying, you don't comply with my demands, I'm going to slaughter you. And most people just won't say it that way. They want to euphemize it, they want to ascribe politically correct language to it. It's called duress. And we have a right not to live under duress. And unfortunately, unless we can convince people at the mental level not to engage in violent behavior, physical force may be required to end that duress and that violence that we live under. The New Age community does not understand this. They resist it. They resist the masculine principle, the sacred masculine principle. And that's why this constitutes a religion. Because it's holding back people from an all-important truth. And that truth is the definitive and objective difference between force and violence. They are not the same thing. They never have been the same thing. They never should be spoken of as the same thing. They are actually polar antitheses of each other. Diametrically opposed opposites. And we'll get into that right now. <laughs> what is, what is, let's start with violence, actually. It's, most people intuitively understand what violence is. Alright? Violence is the immoral usage of physical power employed to coerce, again, coercion, one of the wrongdoings, compel, another word meaning coercion, or restrain. And not rightfully restrain. Restrain because someone is not complying. Someone isn't doing what you told them they must do because you want them to do it. Not to stop them from doing something that is a direct thing that's harming somebody else. Okay? But I'm commanding you, you may not do that, and if you do, I'm going to restrain you or make you do it somehow. That's violence. The word violence is rooted in the, the verb violate. Violence means you're committing to engage in violence. It means you're violating someone else's rights by taking something away from them that you have no right to take. Namely, their life, their property, their rights, or their freedom. When they have not caused harm to another being. And that's the state we're living under. Violence and duress, which is the threat of violence if we don't comply to demands. Violence is the initiation. There's the powerful word. There's the all-important word, folks, when it comes to violence. The initiation of coercive behavior, of coercive action, which is in opposition to morality and natural law for the reason, because it involves the violation of others' rights. That's what makes it violent. You're violating their rights. And it's the initiation of that undue usage of physical power or strength. So again, people will say, well, in, in, in something that happened where there was physical a physical altercation or physical confrontation and usage of force on both sides, that everybody involved was being violent. Wrong! 100% absolutely wrong! A, a, a fight in a, in a grade school between two boys. The teacher comes along and she says, I don't care who started it, you're both, you're both that engaged in violence and you're both wrong. Absolutely, utterly wrong and incorrect. 
who started it began the violence. I don't care what was being said. Words are one thing. First person who acted and attacked somebody else's physical body when they had no right to do that behavior, that was violent behavior. If the other person defended themselves with a physical use of force, that was defensive, forceful behavior, and it was not violent behavior. And people need to understand the difference between these two modes of behavior, these two kinds of action. They are not the same. They are opposites of each other. Violence, there is never a justification for because there is never a justification to initiate coercive action against your fellow man if they've done nothing to harm you or someone else. So violence, you never possess the right to take. Every example of violent behavior is always a wrong and is never a right. Conversely, there is a time to use force, which involves a right. Force is, there is a right to engage in force. So let's look at what force is. Okay? At a, um, a basic underlying level, the definition of force is simply the capacity to do work or cause physical change in the world. It is the use of energy, strength, or active power. That's a scientific definition of force. You know, scientists would use that as a definition for what a force is. The application of force is involved in just about anything we do. Okay? For you to put your clothes on in the morning, you have to engage a certain amount of force on the fabric to lift it and, and then pull it over yourself. All right, for me to set this computer up involved force. I had to use enough force to counteract the gravity that's keeping this weight down to the earth, lift it up and put it on this table. That was the usage of force. Did I harm anybody by doing it? No, so therefore it's not violence. Force is action which is in harmony with morality and natural law because it's application, it's usage, does not violate others' rights. I violated no one's rights by putting this down on the table. By lifting it up, using force, putting it down on the table. You build a, a house, okay? It involved force. You had, to, you had to cut some things, you had to lift some things, hammer some things together, okay? If you didn't harm anybody in the creation, willfully harm somebody in the creation of that, you used force to get it done, but you didn't engage in violence. Okay? I, I don't know how much more clear or belabored I can make that, but ultimately, force is action which is in harmony with natural law, and we possess the right to take it because it doesn't violate the rights of others. Whereas violence always violates the rights of others, and we're never right to take violent behavior. All right? Force can include defensive, a defensive application of strength or power against violence. So in other words, if I go out onto the street and I'm accosted by a mugger who has a switchblade and he says, your wallet or I cut you. And I'm carrying a defensive weapon. Okay? He is just violating my rights and is holding me under duress. I have the right to put that behavior down by whatever amount of force is required to stop him from doing that. Up to and including deadly. I don't have to engage in a deadly usage of force, but you know what? If I feel my life is threatened, I have every right to. I could stop short of that and simply try to dis disable him and so that he's incapable of continuing to perform that action. But you know what? It would be my discretion at that point if someone was physically threatening my life. And that's what people have to understand. You need to understand that is your inherent right. Your inherent right. You also possess an inherent right to do nothing. I think that's a poor choice because I think that's just letting evil run amok in the world with no consequence to the one who engages in it. I think that's a very foolish choice. But would you also be within your rights? Well, you didn't actually harm another that you had no r right to harm uh, in de the defense of application of force to stop them from doing their violent behavior. So you would be within your rights. It wouldn't be a very, I don't think it would be a very smart thing, which is why I'm not a pacifist. Once again, I live the non-aggression principle in every moment of my life. I do not initiate violence against my fellow man. But I find pacifism deplorable because it doesn't come from a level of true self-respect. It means I will never engage in forceful behavior even if I'm within my right to protect myself through its application. And to me, that means you don't really love yourself. 
Okay? I'm not saying you would be wrong for choosing that position. I'm saying it is a low consciousness position. All right? It's not high consciousness. It's not something we should aspire to all be pacifists and say, no matter what anybody else does, I'll never lift a hand to defend myself. Okay? That's deplorable, and largely that's what the New Age movement is teaching people. Largely. Not in all instances, not a blanket statement, but largely. Generalization. We need to deeply understand the difference between force and violence. We need to deeply integrate both principles of enlightenment in our lives, not just one half or the other. And the, there's groups that do this. I call them the halfwayers. Okay? You know, they went halfway to the truth. You know, then they set up their tent and they said, uh, I'm staying right here, I'm not going the rest of the way up the mountain. You know? That's too uncomfortable for me. I don't want to understand that part or that half. Alright? So these groups, you know, take a quick pot shot at them. I call one of them the My Freedom Movement. You know? It's not about freedom for everybody. It's my freedom. As long as my interests and freedom are protected, screw everybody else. You know? Uh, the, the, the big right, super right wingers largely are like that, you know, whole, held in this polarizing dialectic of, you know, politics. You know, uh, they want their freedom to do whatever they want, but you know, hey, uh, we got to go, uh, uh, you know, we got to go over and police the world and attack other sovereign nations and their people to get what we want for our interests. So they don't get the non-aggression principle very well. Not all, again, not a blanket statement, please. Generalization. All right? Not every person in a movement like that thinks the same way. I'm talking about as an aggregate, the aggregate gist of what they're putting out there. All right? They leave out the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and compassion toward others. It's very selfish, left brain imbalance. Most of these people are in left brain imbalance. Overly selfish. Not just enlightened self-interest, they're overly selfish outright. You know, and it's all about their freedom and you know that somebody else's culture doesn't agree with how I live or you know how I want things, then we don't really care about what happens to them. The New Age movement, it's another one of these halfwayers. You know, they don't get it all. And halfway understanding is not going to lead to enlightenment. So the New Age movement is the opposite. This is right brain imbalance. And it leaves out the principle of the sacred masculine of standing up for your, your inherent rights, your natural law rights, and the inherent right to defend yourself against the usage of violence by others with the defensive usage of force. Most New Agers don't want to understand that principle. They want to ignore it. Again, this is all part of this deception of standing down, accepting everything, never resisting wrong or evil. While a totalitarian police state is actively being brought forward in this country and others worldwide, really, faster and faster, the occult controllers, who are really the people who are driving this dynamic at a conscious level, they need to propagate a religion to push people into deeper states of right brain imbalance. Because, see, they need a slave think class to be ruled by their master think class. You know, the master think are people in government, police, military, paramilitary agencies that think, oh, we're God, we're going to do whatever we want unchallenged. Okay? We'll run roughshod on whoever we damn well please or whoever we're ordered to run roughshod all over. All right? And there's not a damn thing anybody's going to do about it because we have the guns. Okay? And they're kidding themselves as far as I'm concerned. You know? That they think they're going to get that done here in this country. Not without resistance, they're not. I'll tell you right, that much right now. Not without consequence. Not without enough of us trying to make their victory so difficult it had seemed like a defeat even if they got it done. Okay? But they need... They need... And I'll be part of that effort till, till the day I leave this reality. Bank on it. 
So what they need, though, that controller class, that mind control class of, of so-called elitists, I, don't, I hate that word for them. You know, I just call them the occult controllers because they ain't the elite of anything except the bottom of a trash can. <laughs> they might be the, the elite of the scum, that layer of scum that collects down at the bottom of your garbage can. Yeah, they're the elite of that. But they need to create this, this polarity of you have the left brain imbalance and that has to play off against right brain imbalance. So we need to propagate religions to keep people enslaved think. Right? So that a lot of people won't stand up for their natural rights. And ladies and gentlemen, as I've been telling you, the New Age movement is part of that religion. Cultural religion plays a big role in that dynamic as well. But the New Age movement is a huge part of that dynamic of mind control. We have to cut through the bullshit and start calling things accurately as they really are. No more politically correct speech. No more niceties and talking to people in sweet, pleasing, hypnotizing tones because we want them to like us. I don't care whether you like me. Folks hate me, as a matter of fact. I don't care whether I am liked. I care about truth and what's going on that is wrong and needs to be corrected. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm not here for a popularity contest. Okay? If I wanted to make $50,000 a session, okay, instead of coming to speak for free, I would blow smoke up your ass all day and tell you exactly what you want to hear and make you feel good the whole time. <laughs> but I won't be giving you a damn lick of truth in the process. Maybe a bit of breadcrumb here and there. But that's what the New Age movement wants to do. And they're raking it in. Raking it in. And I know definitively that what I'm saying there is true. Okay? Because I've talked to some, and people who I know have talked to some of the agents of some of these new age gurus and teachers, and I'm telling you, that's, an, that's a number, and it's probably skyrocketed from there. I'm telling you, some of these people make fifty to $75,000 for getting up and speaking for four hours. Okay? And I'll, I'll tell people, as long as you cover my lodging and travel expense money, so I don't have to put money out of pocket to come and speak, I'll speak anywhere you want me to speak for free. All right? Because I'm not up here trying to make money or tell people what they want to hear. I'm here to tell you the truth about how we need to change so we can end slavery. The real reason, truth be told, that most people, including New Agers, do not want to speak out against the evils of our world, including the slavery system called government, is because deep down inside themselves, they are cowards who lack the courage to stand up to a bully. And they want no confrontation. That's the truth. So get as offended as you like. And bring anybody else who's a new ager and I'll tell that right to their face and they can get as offended as they like. It doesn't matter what your emotional reaction is. Nothing will make that statement untrue. See, we've lost the ability to say the magic word of all power. No. And that's what the new age movement is propagating. It's killing the lost word. I'm giving you right here, how many people obviously have heard of Freemasonry and are somewhat familiar with Freemasonry, okay? I'm giving you right here in this section the epitome of what is known as illuminated Freemasonry from the original esoteric tradition, not the watered-down lodge system that is taught in the modern world that is all about a, an old boys club, uh, you know, doing favors for each other and not really propagating the real teachings of this esoteric tradition. This is what is known in the high-level Freemasonic degrees and what, what you would generally call illuminized Freemasonry as the, the, the pinnacle of understanding. It is the, the pinnacle of the expression of natural law in our lives when we reclaim all of our power and we know what our rights are and we know what our rights are not. It is known in Freemasonry as the lost word. And people will try to tell you it's a million different things that it's not. The lost word is no. Okay? And I'm going to explain it right now. 
The lost word is a concept of esoteric. The word esoteric means the inner core tradition that is generally reserved for a priest class or a inner elite core of practitioners. Whereas you teach the exoteric watered down tradition to what would be, you know, the people who aren't the movers and shakers in the tradition. In Freemasonry, they call them porch masons. The masons of the portico of the temple. They're not on the inside of the temple. They're out on its porch. They haven't gone into the deep understanding. They're just skirting the periphery. Okay? But the esoteric tradition, the inner tradition of Freemasonry, it teaches this concept known as the lost word. It represents a specific state of human consciousness, and that is a state of consciousness that has largely been lost to the majority of human beings. In order to speak the so-called lost word, a human being must work upon themselves in order to achieve a state of balance or equilibrium. Equilibrium is known as the, the path to the lost word in Freemasonry. Many people are told that equilibrium is the lost word. Great movie called Equilibrium. It's all about high-level Freemasonry. Everybody should watch that movie. Okay? It's all about care and the self-defense principle, putting together the two pillars of enlightenment that seem like polar opposites but are actually synthesizing forces. So we have to arrive at that state of balance between the hemispheres of the brain, the left and right brain hemispheres, in order to speak the lost word. In such a state of consciousness, of balanced consciousness, uh, that being has then come to know themselves truly. They know, they know the, the true nature of the self. Okay, because they've studied the microcosmic knowledge of the occult to know the self and the psyche and how it works. All right? And they also know the macrocosmic knowledge, the major arcana, as we talked about earlier. The working operations of the laws of nature, natural law, the laws of morality, the laws of the consequences of behavioral choice through our free will decisions to act in certain ways. Okay? And in doing so, in coming to that place of balance and understanding both the inner and so-called outer knowledge, um, that being has come to understand in that process the objective difference between right and wrong behavior. Whereas they are referred to, as these modes of behavior are referred to in esoteric Freemasonry, light versus darkness. Light, of course, being right action and darkness being wrong action. Now, in this enlightened state of consciousness that is generated through the knowledge of natural law, that being is then able to speak, to say the lost word, which is no. No is the word of all power. Only when we say no to those who would claim to be our owners and those who claim that, you know, it's they who will decide which rights we have or do not have. Only when we say no to that do we ever stop externalizing our power to others, to anyone outside of ourself. And in doing that, we reclaim all of our rights, all of our natural rights, and we become free. Sadly, very, 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 very few people on earth have the knowledge, care, and courage. Again, thoughts, emotions, and actions. Those are the epitome of those three aspects of consciousness. The epitome of the thought modality of consciousness is knowledge. The epitome of the emotion aspect of consciousness is true care. <coughs> care about what's going on. Not just compassion. True care encompasses even more than just compassion or empathy. It means you really, truly, deeply care about what's taking place. Enough to want to go out and develop the courage to then to have the willpower to change it. And then courage is the expression of action. Courage and willpower is the highest, are the highest expressions of action. The three modes of consciousness... And unfortunately, since so few people have developed these three modalities of consciousness to their full expression, most people cannot utter the lost word. And that's why it is considered lost and called the lost word. See, the lost word isn't just N-O. It's K-N-O-W. The lost word is no. 
but it's also no. Because one doesn't is impossible without the other. The word no and no is not possible without knowing our rights, without knowledge. And that's why knowledge is completely, or I should say completely, largely dismissed in New Age teachings. They want to tell you it's all only about going inside. Well, no, it is not. Okay? The book knowledge, a continued de-emphasization is placed upon reading and book knowledge in the New Age community. Oh, we'll just know everything we need to know by meditating. We'll go into the Akashic records and get everything we need. Well, once again, how's it been working? Has it been working out good? Because I see slavery. I don't see freedom. I don't see enlightenment. I don't see higher levels of consciousness. I see that in tiny, ins almost insignificant, paltry pockets scattered to the four winds of the earth. That's how I see that dynamic of higher consciousness. I'm not saying it's not happening, but it's certainly not happening enough. <laughs> and if we want to change it and make it happen more, make it happen enough, we have to get real about this and understand knowledge is required. If we don't know, we won't say no. So that brings me to the last part of this section, which I call the last word. Which, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is what I want to avert. I don't want to see it have to go this way. All my work is to try to avert this. But if it comes to that, I will be ready. Just as our forefathers were ready when they were, their rights were, inherent natural rights were completely abused under the dictates of a psychopathic tyrant boy king who thought he was God. Okay? Just as anybody who has ever been held under a state of duress and slavery has the right to defend themselves and end that condition. So, the last word will not be spoken. You will hear it in shots and explosions. That's when you will hear the last word uttered. But you will not hear it in the form of human speech. And believe me, it will be the most atrocious language you will ever hear. And if we want to avert it, we better get active, and we better start telling people the truth about what's really going on in this damn place. And get involved ourselves in being teachers of this information. Like I said, if it does come to that, I'll be ready. I don't put all my eggs in this basket. This is the basket I put most of my eggs in. I got a few in that one, too. <laughs> may or may not be enough, but there's some in there. There's enough for me to at least fang and venomize myself so I won't go quietly into the night. Not without consequence. Not without a struggle. No sir. Not me. And you know what? I tell people, whenever I play th this slide for people, I tell them, take a good look at the image on that slide. What you are seeing there is a 100% peaceful human being that would never use the defensive capacity for the rightful use of force for violence. That's a peaceful human being on the screen right there who knows his inherent rights. I know what I own. I know what I don't own. I know what my rights are. I know what my rights are not. I know the difference between those modalities of action, and I live the non-aggression principle in every moment of my life. And anybody who doesn't understand that that is an inherent human right is under mind control. Mind control. Only a slave is not allowed to be armed to protect themselves and their family and their rights. Only a slave is not allowed to be armed. That's all I'll say about that. Now, this principle of the two pillars combined together, the sacred feminine principles of, of non-aggression and compassion toward others, combined with the sacred masculine principle of self-defense, has been 
encoded symbolically through many mystery traditions throughout the ancient world. All right, I'll just touch on a couple you know, again, just to give people a hint. But you can see this in tons of ancient mystery traditions. The Aztec mystery schools had a teaching that was about the, the feathered serpent. This came from uh, an older Mayan teaching uh, that, that the feathered serpent was Kukulkan, who I'll bring up in another slide later. But uh, in this tradition, he was referred to as Quetzalcoatl, which means the, 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 the uh, Quetzal bird combined with the Kotal that was the serpent or the snake. So you have one high level of consciousness, and you have one that's very rooted to the ground. The bird flies in the air, the snake slithers on the ground. What this really meant was we are aspiring to both the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine principles. The sacred feminine principle was about flying in the air at a higher level of consciousness, which is the non-aggression principle understood and ingrained in our lives. But it is combined with and tempered and balanced with the sacred masculine principle of the serpent that is there and ready to strike if its rights come under attack. Okay? So again, there's that Hulk principle again. We have to know what our rights are. If someone's coming to take them, we have to be prepared to defend ourselves. That is our responsibility. It's not anybody else's responsibility. It's our own individual responsibility and our own community responsibility. Okay, we advocate that responsibility when we say, let's give all that ability and power to government and let them do that job. You know? That's the abdication of personal responsibility. Of doing something people are loath to do. Stand up with the defensive use of physical force when they come under attack by psychopathic people. Good people are some for some reason loath to do that. Now, I'm not telling you I would want to have to do that continuously or con constantly, but I'll tell you why it's, it, it would happen more and more when you fail to properly morally educate the young. Because the young who are not properly moral, morally educated grow up to be adults who flagrantly violate the non-aggression principle and engage in violent behavior. And that's why we're in the situation we're in. So again, Quetzalcoatl, the serpent and the bird combined. And I, what I love is it's covered with the feminine principle, the feathers. You only see the snake at the head, but the whole body is covered like the feathers of a bird. Beautiful. That means most of the time the sacred feminine is displayed, but the serpent's there. You know, try to play with it and find out how much the serpent is there. You don't want to mess with the rights of that serpent which is why I love the Gadsden flag so much. A great symbol. Rattlesnake, Christopher Gadsden of Georgia, don't tread on me. You know, the rattlesnake wants to be left alone and is there to live his life. He's not going to go act out and actively hunt people to try to sink his venomous fangs into. But go, go poking at the rattlesnake with a, snip, with a stick. Find out what happens. You know, that's what he, Gadsden was trying to say when he made that flag. We don't want to fight. But do you want to keep coming? You'll find one. I'm sorry, let me go back a slide there. Uh, this is from the uh, South American mystery tradition in, I believe it's Bolivia. Uh, this is a, a depiction on uh, a large me megalithic structure known as the Sun Gate. I believe the city is Tiwanaku, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think it is. Uh, pretty sure. This is the Sun God Viracocha. And again, you see him standing between the two pillars, holding these two pillars, symbolically representing the two pillars of enlightenment, of the solar consciousness. The sun enlightened consciousness, because he was the sun god of this mystery tradition school. Okay? And one is the sacred feminine principle, one is the sacred masculine principle. They both have to be there, they both have to be in our grasp, they both have to be balanced. This is all about balance, folks. Whereas the New Age teachings are all about right brain, too much feminine imbalance without the sacred masculine presence. Uh, the Gnostic tradition depicted on the left there with the serpent and the dove, very similar to the Aztec or Mayan tradition of uh, Quetzalcoatl slash Kukulkan. Again, you have the bird, the snake, you know, the bird represents peace, that's why they chose a dove, while the snake is there underneath. 
okay, if required. So, again, I don't think I need to belabor that symbol. I think from what I've already explained, you can get that. Um, this is just a, uh, it's a slide, it's a uh, cover image from some movie. I, I think it's called The Man Who Came to Earth, which is about some extraterrestrial being that comes down on the Earth and has to learn how to interact with human beings. If I'm not mistaken, I don't even really remember. But I love the image because I put this up here to represent what is known as the Hermetic Tradition which is a, a very deep traditional philosophy that came out of uh, Egypt, that came out of uh, ancient Greece, really it predates Egypt, and it goes right into pre-Diluvian times. Uh, uh, an advanced mystery tradition that really delves deeply into natural law principles. And one of the things that is deeply taught in the Hermetic tradition is we need to aspire to be the stellar beings, the beings whose mind is in the stars, is in the cosmos, is in a higher part of the universe, all right? But our feet do not leave the earth. The work is done on the ground. We act as a bridge between heaven and earth. And, you know, you may see depictions in tarot cards of, you know, the magician. He has one arm up, one arm down like that. He's channeling the energy of the divine and bringing it down to the earth with his body as a conduit. That's what the stellar man tradition in Hermeticism was about. It's a balanced approach. It means you aspire to those higher levels of consciousness, but you do the work here in the physical world firmly rooted with your feet on the ground. And that's the balance that is lacking in the New Age community. Action is dismissed. Whereas all these cosmic notions are all constantly thrown around there, but there's no anchoring to take it down to the ground and use it on a practical level to change things here. Because again, what does that require? Willpower, courage. These are masculine components. These are actually components that a balanced left brain hemisphere helps us to forge. If we're out of balance in the right hemisphere, we're not going to develop those qualities. Conversely, if we're out of balance in the left hemisphere, we're not going to develop the, compa the creative capacities, the intuitive capacities, the nurturing and compassionate capacities. It needs to be balanced. If you hear nothing else, understand that this is about the balance between these different traits and characteristics of the being. And I think the Hermetic tradition did a very good job in... Uh, practicing that balance, bringing it forward to people in very practical and easy to understand philosophical terms. New Age deception number eight. No one is ever to blame. No one's to blame. It all just happened that way. <laughs> you know, we didn't actually do this through our actions. It just happened. You know, You should never point a finger at anybody else. Now let me tell you something. You shouldn't point a finger at anybody else if you're doing the same thing they're doing. I'm not part, through my behavior, of the slavery dynamic. I'm not part of that dynamic. Okay? When other people are part of that dynamic, through being left brain in balance and being a dominator, or being in extreme right brain in balance and laying down to slavery, they're part of that dynamic. I'm not in that mental state of mind control. I'm out. I'm out of that state. I can say that with a deep knowing that it's true and a clear conscience that I'm not lying when I say it. So, unfortunately, are most people out of that state of mind control? No, they're deeply in it. Okay? So, when, when I say there are individuals who are deserving of blame and that there are others who are not deserving of blame, it's true. There are certain people who are directly responsible for what's happening because of the way they think, and that thought underlies the behaviors that they're taking. All right? So let's move on with other aspects of this deception. Where this really comes from, underneath, what, again, it's never said like this, but this is what people are hearing at a subconscious level, and it's what the real teaching is conveying, whether the propagators of the concept that there's no one ever to blame for anything are aware of it or not. What they're really teaching people is we are not responsible for our own behavior. No one is responsible. Responsibility doesn't exist, and again, this goes on with that sub-deception I talked about earlier of there's no such thing as free will. Again, a person I consider a friend looked me in the eyes and said free will doesn't exist. No one is ultimately responsible for their own behavior. 
And I didn't even laugh at that. I felt sad when I heard that. I felt sorry that that person could be worked into that state of consciousness. Because that's deep mind control. And, you know, this person does a lot of other things right, too. But that was so wrong and incorrect that I didn't even lash out against the person. I was like, it was like, oh, I felt horrible that he could even be in that state of mind. Because this is what he's brought on to. No one's to blame. There's no free will. And ultimately, we're not responsible. These are hallmarks of extreme right brain imbalance. And here's what underlies it. Never exercise discernment or judgment regarding whether an action is right or wrong. Don't really weigh that in your own mind and look at the dynamic as harm caused and therefore it's a wrong. I was having a conversation the other night as to what actions are right or wrong. I said, you only need to ask one thing. In the performance of that action was something that you do not own harmed. That's it. It's all the question we need to ask. Here's a behavior. Was something harmed? Yes or no is the answer. Did you own that thing and therefore have a right to do anything harmful to it? I gave the example. Here's my paint defender. I own this. This is mine. I own this finger. If I want to take some wire cutters and snip it off, guess what? That's my finger. It would probably be a very stupid thing to do. However, would I be within my rights to do that? Absolutely. You want to know why? It's mine. I own it. And that's the other thing that goes along with a lot of this. You know, another de- deception I really should add, I might do it at a future point, is it goes along with there's no such thing as ownership. Many New Agers believe that too, that ownership doesn't exist. A lot of white brain people buy into that one. There are things that people own legitimately. Ownership is real. It's not an illusion. And again, because they try to go into this idea of the extreme, the extremity. Could I own this forever? No. It's temporary. It's impermanent. Does that mean while I'm here in this incarnation, inhabiting this body, my, while my consciousness inhabits this body, that this isn't my possession? Of course it doesn't mean that. Okay? You can own things while you are here. It doesn't matter whether you consider this stewardship of my little finger and not permanent ownership. I'm not claiming permanent ownership. I'm claiming while my consciousness is here in this vehicle that we call the body in the 3D reality, this is my damn finger. Okay? It's close enough to ownership. It doesn't have to be permanent. All right? So, however, however, if I went up to this gentleman and said, put your little finger out and you take the wire cutters, I have no right to do that. Not without his consent, which would also be pretty stupid, right? <laughs> the point here is, if you're harming something and it belongs to someone else and you have no right to it, to do that to it, that's violence. That's wrong. Okay? So with the New Age movement and this deception of no one's ever to blame for the harmful things that they have done is really saying is, never exercise discernment or judgment regarding the behavior, the actions of another being. They're not responsible for what they did. No one's to blame. You know? Huge deception, all tied in with the excusing of evil. All tied in. You can see how a lot of these mesh and blend together and overlap. Okay? So that's what they're really saying in this deception. So, bullshit. Let's correct it. Let's bring balance to that. We have to understand the, the philosophical idea of moral culpability. And this is a true notion that exists in nature. Okay? It's not a judgment that only exists in mind, because right and wrong don't just exist in mind, they exist inherently. Therefore, so does moral culpability exist inherently based upon the action someone performs. The word culpability, let's define it from the etymology. Culpable comes from the Latin noun culpa, fault or blame, in Latin. So culpable means what the, uh, the, the, the quality of being at fault, or the, the quality of deserving the blame for what has resulted, for what has manifested. So you think about it, if a child is raped, let's give that horrific example, which I keep going back to. 
someone was responsible, someone did it. Without them performing that horrific behavior, the manifestation of the child having been raped would not have occurred. Therefore, they are to blame and they are responsible. Okay? Culpability is real. It exists in nature. It's not something that we invent or just try to, you know, graft onto and it, it's not just a perception. It's real. It is the determination of who is ultimately at fault or deserving of blame for the commission of actions which resulted in harm or loss to others. That's what moral culpability is. Okay? And ultimately what it really is, is responsibility. Who is responsible? When we're determining who's culpable, what we're really saying is who was responsible for this wrong that took place, which manifested. Okay? This is what the New Age movement doesn't want. And again, it all comes down to wanting to abdicate personal responsibility for our free will choices. Okay? The abdication of personal responsibility is the defining characteristic of a child's mind. That's what children want. They don't want responsibility. They don't want to truly grow up or mature. They want to stay children for as long as they can. And that's what humanity is going through. Where we should be well into adolescence and adulthood by now, we're still stunted children. And this is the dynamic. The refusal to accept personal responsibility for the choices of behavior that we make at an individual level. Something that is very unpopular to hear. You know, but nonetheless it is true. Another part of this correction, which is very more unpopular, I should say, and I take a lot of flack for this one, and I still get people that disagree. They still disagree no matter how much I qualify and clarify this. And I, I, I'll tell you what to do. Start this up at a dinner conversation or at a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll be the head of the Seriously, though, you'll see how polarizing this is. How many people have it wrong. There's a real correct answer to this. Now, the first part of this is don't hear what you want to hear. Hear the question as it is actually being asked. Because that's what we do. We hear what we want to hear. We're not listening to the actual question. Here is the actual question. Who is more morally culpable in this instance? I didn't ask who's morally culpable. Both parties are morally culpable. The question, ladies and gentlemen, and those watching on the net, is who is more morally culpable. And what you have to ask is, without one of these groups, if we remove one of these groups, does the manifested result still occur? That's how you will know who is more morally culpable. Listen to the qualifications of how you will arrive at the correct answer. Remove one side. And then say to yourself, well, that same action, could that same action actually occur without those beings being involved? Okay? So, who is always more morally culpable? The order giver, the one who issues a command that is morally wrong, or the order follower, the one that actually actually carries out the immoral behavior that manifests in harm? I think the answer is, look, the answer should be so self-evident that I shouldn't have to ask the question. And unfortunately, there are still so many people who are deeply resistant to this. And I'm, not, I'm telling you, the answer it, there is one answer, it is the correct answer to this question, and nothing will ever change it. Alright? And the answer is, the order follower is always, in all instances, more morally culpable than the one who issues the command to do a harmful behavior. Because they did it. They carried out the thought. Thought 
Just thinking something doesn't make it manifest in the world, folks. Contrary to another New Age deception. Okay? Behavior manifests things on Earth in the physical domain. Behavior is what does that. So, when we're looking at the answer to this question, what we have to ask is, when a, when a horrific action like this occurs, okay, you look at that screen and you see it, the result of war. You see a child dead, laying in her father's arms. Okay, I'm sorry for the graphic imagery, but I want to hammer home a point here. Okay? No one would want that to be their child. No one should have to endure this. Okay? The point here is, when we look at the behavior that manifested this condition, and the parties involved, and we're searching for who is actually the most morally culpable party, here's the questions that need to be asked, the question that needs to be asked. Whose actions actually created that manifested condition? So when I put this meme on Facebook one time, and I got like hate mail back from him, okay? Because so many people who have people in the military don't want to hear the truth because it's very uncomfortable. And I'm telling you, I got mail, I got Facebook mail from a lot of nasty, viciously angry people who would want my head for saying something like this. And you know what? I'll continue to say it because it's true. Because it's true. If these groups of people make that same same statement, my actions didn't cause that. Now listen to the words, not what you want to hear or are comfortable hearing. Listen to the statement. Here's one group of people, the politicians saying, my actions didn't cause that. Oh, their words may have put the idea in some others' heads, but did their actions cause that? Did they actually create that condition. They were part of its creation, but the actualization of that condition manifested as a result of physical behavior of the beings here on the right. And if they said, my actions didn't cause that, both claiming the same statement, my question to determine moral culpability the most moral culpability is who is lying and who is telling the truth. Well, as uncomfortable as it is to hear, uh, Barry Satoro over there and uh, you know uh, George Bush of the former Scherf family of uh, the Schutzstaffel and uh, uh, Slick Willie aren't lying there. <laughs> they, they, you know, most of the time their mouths are moving their lying, but in this instance they're not. Okay? The people over here who never really truly grew up in conscience are lying. Okay? As painful as that is to hear. The painful truth is the order follower always bears more moral culpability than the order giver for the reason that the order follower is the one who actually performed the behavior. And in taking such action, they actually brought the resultant harm into physical manifestation in the, in the world, in the reality we are in. Order following is the pathway to every form of evil and chaos. Order following is not a virtue. It never has been a virtue. It is not a virtue now. It never will be a virtue. It is evil. 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 Okay? That's what it really is. Anybody who is an order follower, I don't care if you even take orders from people you consider moral beings, you're still carrying out evil. To abdicate your own personal responsibility to perform right action, that's an evil act in and of itself. To say, I'm not going to think about whether the action is moral or not, I'm just going to do. That's beast, satanic consciousness. Or I should say it's beast, satanic unconsciousness. Order followers 
and should never be considered a virtue by anyone who considers themselves a moral human being. Order followers have ultimately been personally responsible and morally culpable for every form of slavery and every single totalitarian regime that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. Blanket statement. No exception to the rule. 100% true at all times and places forever. Blanket statement. The ego hates blanket statements. It doesn't want blanket statements to exist. The ego hates the word every, all, at all times, at all places. Hates it. Wants to eradicate that. The ego loves relativism. Loves relativism. That's its food. It can't get enough relativism. Absolutes are the most despised thing of the human ego, especially when it comes to natural law absolutes, which exist and are real. Okay? Why do they call it a police state, ladies and gentlemen? Why don't they call it a banker state? You don't hear a totalitarian regime referred to as a politician state, do you? Is it called a presidential state? Is it called a Congress state? Is it called a, a supreme judiciary state? No. No. You know? It's not called a priest state or a judge state. No. It's called a police state. Because they're the ones who bring it into manifested reality. And therefore that language is perfectly consistent with the laws of manifestation. That's why it's called a police state. Because they're the ones who do it. They're the ones who create it. Not the people issuing them their orders. The ones who carry them out. The ones who listen to the voice of evil and say yes to it. They don't use the lost word. Yep, that's who brings an evil into the world. New Age deception number nine, the false notion of forgiveness. We should forgive everything, and we should forgive people even if they're not sorry for what they've done. 100% unconditional forgiveness. And what they're really saying by this, okay, is never take action to defend yourself when a wrong is being committed and excuse evil endlessly. See, again, standing down, not taking action. You see a re repetitive hallmark of this religion. Okay? And yes, they do teach this. And so does almost all other religions. And again, it is a vile, deplorable ideology. Pacifism. Which is what this is a part of. And like I said, I don't feel that the, the concept of turn the other cheek in biblical terms... Okay? Never meant continue to excuse wrong, wrongdoing forever and be tolerant of evil in the world. That's not what those words meant. It meant when you are coming to people with truth that is uncomfortable for them to hear, particularly people you care about, family members, friends, etc., okay, and you offer them the spiritual gold of truth with your outstretched hand because you want to help allay their suffering for not understanding what's going on, and then they spin at you, and they slap you in the face, and they smack the truth out of your hand and say, I don't want to hear it, I'm not interested and what you're telling me is too painful for me to hear. You say, thank you, may I have another, and I will continue to come back and tell you the same thing until you do understand it. Okay? I'll just make it personal. I'll give you a personal anecdote. All right? My own mother looks at the work I do as a waste of time and an atrocity of what I've made with my life. And I'm totally comfortable with that. I'm not saying that in a totally sad way. That's her level of consciousness. Okay? If I was a ruthless, psychopathic banker who was making millions of dollars, bilking people out of their earnings, and engaged in ridiculous usury to get something I didn't truly earn, but I was successful in the measured so-called value system of fake money, 
then I would be, it would be so wonderful for what I'm doing. Okay? And the, the phrase she actually looked me in the eyes and said to me once is, I think of what you could have become versus what you're actually doing. And it makes me sad. And you know what? It's, a, it's initially like a little knife hit. But then you have to consider the source. And you have to say, what's this being's level of consciousness? And the answer is completely unconscious. And that, again, that's a choice in today's world. It's not, that's not just something that that's how she is. It's a choice. So do I actually say, yes, that person is actually morally culpable for having that level of consciousness because they continue to ignore truth? Yes. But you know what? Do I Have I stopped bringing that message and speaking it? Absolutely not. And every time that being is in my presence, I'm speaking the truth. Whether they get it or not, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That's the right thing to do. That's what turning the other cheek is. To take a shot like that from your own blood and still say, I'm still going to bring you the truth. I don't care what you say. I don't care how scathing or biting it is. That's what I'm charged to do and I'm going to do it. So keep spitting, keep slapping, keep stabbing. It doesn't make a difference. Okay? It doesn't mean somebody commits an act of violence against you or keeps abusing you and you just say, it's okay, keep doing it. That's no self-respect. That means you don't really care enough about yourself to say, hey, this is going to stop. You know? In a, in a physically abusive relationship, you know, where one uh, spouse is physically abusing the other and the other person won't leave and keeps taking the abuse, they're partially morally culpable for that. A lot of people won't want to hear that. Say, no, it's all one way. It's all it's all the person doing the abuse. No, it isn't. You don't say no, you are tacitly saying yes. And therefore, you are agreeing for that to continue to happen at some level. Not excusing the original behavior, that's obviously much worse to engage in violence. But we have become part tacit acceptors and participators in that violence when we just turn the other cheek in this false notion of forgiveness. That has nothing to do with true forgiveness. Zero. Zero. I'm all for real forgiveness, and I'm going to explain what real forgiveness is during the correction part of this. But you know what this kind of fake-ass Christian notion of forgiveness is? It's called bullshit. <laughs> it's called the, the boot stamping on the face of the person saying, thank you, sir, can you press a little bit harder? Okay? There's no self-respect involved in that. It's bullshit. <laughs> all right? That's not what real forgiveness is. Well, what is real forgiveness? Let's look at that. True forgiveness does not mean continuing to excuse the willful commission of wrongdoing an infinite number of times. That is not what true forgiveness is. That is naivete at best and cooperation with evil at worst which is what the New Age movement and a lot of religious, false religious teaching te teaches. True forgiveness is completely different than the concept of letting go, which is what a lot of people are confusing with this notion of, un uh, or I, I, I should say, that's what unconditional forgiveness is being passed off as, this notion of letting go. And it's only about you and your perception of the events that have happened. So like, you know, a child who was raped when they were young, they can let go and eventually say, I, I'm no longer being actively affected by that trauma. That's a letting go process from a trauma that has been endured. That's different from forgiveness. Even if they use the word for I forgive you, it's different than what forgiveness actually is. Okay? True forgiveness is always a two-way street involving both the wrongdoer and the person who was wronged. The one-way variant or notion of forgiveness is called letting go. That means I'm going to say I acknowledge what happened that was wrong and evil. I know it happened to me. I know it traumatized me. And I'm, not I'm going to let that go and not allow that to affect me in the present moment so I don't relive the trauma over and over again. 
especially in my physiology through visualizing the trauma over and over again and then creating a stress reaction in the body. That's a letting go process. That's not what forgiveness is. Okay? So what is actual true forgiveness? It starts with these words right here. True forgiveness can not take place until the wrongdoer utters those words. It doesn't have to be those exact words, but it has to be some variant that conveys that message. Okay? That's where true forgiveness begins. The one who did the violent or harmful behavior has to acknowledge that was wrong what I did. Okay? It starts with a sincere apology. And that begins with willingness on the part of the person who did the violent behavior to tell the truth and acknowledge what they did that was wrong and then stop doing it to cease the engagement in their previous violent behavior. That's where true forgiveness and true reconciliation begins. Then the wrongdoer can say, I accept that apology and I can let go without taking any repercussive action because I'm saying I'm giving you the benefit of doubt of the doubt on your word and I'm not coming to reclaim this debt that, uh, about the wrong you just did to me. That's real forgiveness. That means I'm saying you owe me nothing else except those words of apology and not continuing to do the action. Then it's not a sincere apology. New Age Deception number 10. The watered-down version of the laws of attraction. And this is what's being taught as the so-called secret in the New Age community. All right? And it's not the real laws of attraction. It is a tiny, tiny, infinitesimal part of the real law of attraction, which is natural law. Natural law is the real cosmic laws of attraction. And like I said, I recommend anybody, if you want to delve deeper into that, it goes hand in hand with this, the understanding of this seminar. We have some in the back, and it is actually also posted for free on my website in the videos section. Everyone here should watch that three-part seminar. It's the most powerful work I've ever done. Okay? It's the information that people need to see and understand to get out of the slavery mindset. And it's the thing that the New Age movement is actively working to prevent people from gaining an understanding of. All right? So what does this New Age variant of laws of attraction entail in the secret? Well, it's about visualizing something that you want, a condition that you want, then feeling an emotion in the body, okay? And then somehow that's going to manifest itself if you hold the right mind state and emotional state. And again, there's a de-emphasis on action when it comes to putting into manifestation those conditions. Not only is there a de-emphasis on the active component, the masculine component of action, but it is extremely rooted in the dynamic, the modality of service to self mentality. Because it's all about, do you want to make more money? Do you want the better cushy job? Do you want the better car? Do you want to live in the better apartment? Do you want to live by the better house? Making your vision board, you know? The vision board. You might have the word peace on there or something, or the word love or a heart or something, but it's all about me, what I am going to get out of it. It never really truly looks in the aggregate sense of pulling back and saying, what do you desire for the world? The true care aspect. It's about what do I individually care about and want my base desires, largely. That's how it's certainly taught in The Secret. It's why some Law of Attraction uh, teachers actually backed out of The Secret and, and were interviewed and then say, I see the direction this is going and say, I don't really want to do it. Now, I'm not saying Byrne, who I, I believe wrote the book The Secret, is a total deceiver. I, I think she misunderstands or doesn't know about natural law at all. Okay? But... The, the variant of this, these so-called laws of attraction that are put out by this are not the real laws of attraction. 
Again, the real laws of attraction have to do with moral behavior and the consequences of either living in harmony with moral law or in opposition to it. Those are the real laws of attraction. So, this version is all based in ego. It's all ego-driven. Again, what do I want to get out of this? Not what's right, what needs to be changed, what I want to see happen for humanity in the aggregate. What do I want in my own immediate situation? That's all ego-based. And ultimately bullshit. So let's correct this. Once again, you'll notice the de-emphasis on the masculine component of consciousness or action. We keep going back to that as a theme. You'll see that in just about all of these deceptions. Okay? Thoughts and emotions. Thoughts and emotions. They're highlighted and stressed in this fake version of the laws of attraction. And the action component is diminished and not, not considered as important as the other two. Once again, the thing that's never touched on by the New Age is natural law. Once again, just a label. You could call it the laws of consequence. You could call it the laws of morality. You could call it karmic law, moral law, God's law. Once again, it's just a label. It's the laws of nature that govern the consequences of our behavioral choices. So I've already really touched on what the real law of attraction is throughout the seminar. I'll just, uh, you know... Give the basic short working definition, universal, non-man-made, binding and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of behavior. That's my working definition for the term natural law. And those are the real laws of attraction. Here's the expressions of natural law that I've outlined in a chart. And um, there's a positive expression and a negative expression. So we have a generative force or polarity that we're working with. This is the first thing we work with. And every behavior, every action that we choose is an expression of either love or fear. In all moments, in every free will decision, we're either choosing love or fear. Of course, love is the expansive force of consciousness. It is the force which allow, allows consciousness to unfold and to grow. It's not romantic love. Okay? Romantic love is a totally separate thing. All right? I'm talking about love when it comes to consciousness. All right? What is love? Love is truth. Love is a desire to take truth into oneself and then share it. That's what real love is. Not, again, Hollywood romance novel definition of love. We're not talking about that kind of love between a man and a woman or even a family member or even friends. We're talking about the love of truth, the force which expands awareness. Fear is the opposite. It shuts awareness down. You don't learn when you're in fear. You go into fight-flight mode. That shuts your consciousness down. You know, when you're in fear mode, fight-flight mode, what happens in the physiology? Heart starts beating faster. Why? Because if you're going to fight the, the threat, whether it's a physical threat or a stress reaction, the, the blood gets pumped into the arms, okay, to fight. If you were going to fight, if you're going to choose the fight response over the flight response, you need your upper extremities hardened so you could beat back the attack. If you're going to fl flee the flight response, the blood also pumps to the extremities, the legs, so you can flee and get out of there quicker because the leg muscles need to be reinforced. Okay? That's what stress is. That's why all the blood is in the extremities and it's away from two places that are needed for proper health and proper cognitive function. The blood gets pumped out of the torso where all the internal organs are that regulate the other functions of the body and it gets pumped away from the brain. That's why we can't think in fight or flight mode or fear. Okay? You're not going to do any uh, higher order thinking in a deep state of fear. Your body is saying you're either going to fight this or you're going to get the hell out. So that's what I mean when I say love and fear. Now, the initial expression when we put one of these to use in the world is either knowledge or ignorance. Again, love is the desire for truth, to take truth into yourself. So when we do that, we become knowledgeable. Knowledge is what I call the initial, and I, I misspell that there, I'll correct it you know, when this goes online. I repeated something there, but uh, it's the initial expression, okay? 
Knowledge is the seeking of truth and then fulfilling that search. Okay? The opposite that's rooted in fear is ignorance. When we ignore what's really there, we are refusing truth. We are saying to the truth, I don't want you. I don't want to admit to you in or to receive that which is. All right? Then something happens inside of us on an individual level. We either we develop an understanding of the truth of our situation. And we either know that we are sovereign beings. That's the knowledge that we have taken in. And then we have an understanding of what sovereignty is and what it means. I call this the state of internal monarchy. An internal monarch is what a sovereign is. A sovereign means monarch. If you look up a dictionary definition, it's not going to say not a slave, which is what it really means. It's going to say it's a monarch, a king or a queen. Well, the king or the queen was the only one who was above rule of another because they were the ruler. And again, we're all sovereigns. We're all kings and queens. None of us are actual slaves in, in actual reality. Our condition is one of slavery, but it doesn't mean we are legitimately slaves by our nature. Okay? So, sovereignty is the state of understanding our individual internal monarchy, that we are all monarchs, one rulers. And you know the one thing that we rule, or should be in rulership of, the self. The kingdom of the self is our kingdom as an internal monarch, when we recognize and deeply understand our sovereignty. I rule a kingdom of one, me, myself, and I. My thoughts, my emotions, my actions, those are the expressions of that kingdom of one. And I don't rule anybody else, and I don't have the right to rule anybody else. Okay? When we don't understand that, because we're in a state of fear and ignorance, we are in a state of confusion internally. Okay? So the internal negative expression is confusion, or what I call internal anarchy. That means no one's ruling the house. No one's ruling the kingdom of self. Anarchy doesn't mean no rules, as we'll get to. It means no rulers. If there's no ruler present inside, he's going to be ruled from the outside. And that's why the human condition is the way that it is. Too many people are in the state of fear, ignorance, and confusion and don't understand their own personal sovereignty or the sovereignty of all others. The external expression of what happens in the aggregate in a society is either freedom or slavery. And again, even control is a euphemization. I should take that out and just put slavery in there. So, if we're in a state of expanded consciousness, we receive knowledge by seeking truth. We understand that we are sovereign, and then in the aggregate, our society becomes free. If we don't understand the truth because we've been in a state of fear and we've refused to accept it and we're internally confused, we end up being enslaved. We, are, we go into a state of slavery, which is external monarchy. A ruler outside of ourselves ruling over us as if we are their slave. The final result, or what you could call the manifestation, the, the generated expression of this chart, is either order or chaos. So what we've just described there, the expanded force of consciousness, being open to that, taking in knowledge by seeking truth, understanding our own sovereignty, the external expression throughout the society, the aggregate of all the beings in the society is freedom, that's order, or what we generally have called everything that we want, or goodness. Okay? The opposite manifestation, if we are in a state of fear, total ignorance results, we refuse the truth, we don't understand our sovereignty, we go into a state of internal confusion, this whole society ends up enslaved as a result, that's evil or chaos. That's the real laws of attraction in a nutshell. That's natural law in a nutshell right there. Understand these are unilateral. You cannot cross over to the chart. If you start in love, you can't get ignorance. If you start in fear, you can't get knowledge. Okay? Being in a state of internal confusion does not result in freedom. You can't cross over on the chart. They go in one direction only. 
Okay? Which is why it's a very difficult cycle to break. What understanding natural law is, is service to truth. It goes beyond service to self, which is the fake New Age uh, law of attraction, how, what it's rooted in. And it even goes beyond service to others. I tell people, I don't teach natural law because I love human beings. I don't particularly love human beings when I see how they behave. Okay? I, I feel sorry for most human beings. You know, because they're in a shameful, pitiable condition. But, I continue to try to teach natural law to whoever will listen. Not because I so care about human beings, because I care about truth. And that is who I serve. That is what I serve. You want to anthropomorphize it as, you know, the, the woman holding the scales of justice and the sword of truth. You know, the goddess figure, as has been depicted in many traditions. Think of it like that. It's just a symbol. You know, I, I call truth a her. You know, it's a feminine force. It's the force that we have to be open to. It's what does this. That's a feminine expression, to be wide open. It's not a position of vulnerability. It's a position of power, the sacred feminine energy. That's what opens us up to the reception of the knowledge of natural law. And when we're in that modality, we go beyond serving the self, we even go beyond serving others. We're then serving truth. And that's the only thing I bend the knee to, and to no other force. We co-create, this is the other counterbalance and correction to the fake laws of attraction. We co-create our shared reality in the aggregate. Individual choices, whether they are based in harmony with natural law or in opposition to natural law, influence the quality of the shared experience of all the people in that given society. This dynamic acts as a perfect expression of the principle of correspondence, one of the real laws of attraction. Okay, That which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. Okay? It means what is going on on as a whole, all right, on the individuated scale, what is taking place in the aggregate, okay? You have a whole lot of people acting this way and a whole tiny bit of people that are acting in truth and goodness and trying to counterbalance all that evil. The expression that's going to manifest is the evil, the thing that has the numbers. It's another big lie in the New Age movement that quantum shifts in reality only happen when tiny, tiny amounts of people engaged in those modalities of behavior, and that's nonsense. Numbers are required. Numbers are required. Numbers are required to counterbalance the dynamic that's already taking place. A few people living in truth and in harmony with natural law are going to make a damn bit of difference if the whole society is evil and corrupt. Understand it. Doesn't, you don't need to be comfortable with it. That's true. Know that that's how it works. Because if anybody's telling you it doesn't work like that, they're lying and lying to you and deceiving you, whether deliberately or by rote repetition of something that's untrue. Okay? So, as happens on the small scale in individual people, when you put that all together in the aggregate, that's what the whole society is going to be like. That's the expression, the manifestation you're going to get. So conversely to what the New Age movement tells people, for a quantum shift in consciousness and a quantum shift in the manifested reality that we're experiencing to actually take place, numbers are required. That's why the only way we're going to change people's minds is if we start speaking to them. You can't just say, I get it and that's okay and it's all right because I'm okay. It, it is our responsibility to teach others who are ignorant if we are in a position of knowledge. New Age deception number 11. Chaos should be feared. It's always a terrible, bad thing. Now, I just told you that the real expression of chaos is the negative expression of natural law, negative manifestation. 
That doesn't mean that there is no role for chaos. However, let's temper this from the very beginning. That doesn't mean you should say, let it all go to shit. Okay? And let's just have chaos constantly. That's extreme imbalance. What I'm saying is fear of failure, fear of something going wrong, fear of something happening that is harmful or is something that hurts you and you, you fall, you, you've made a mistake and you experience the result of making that mistake is not something that should constantly be feared so that we want to sanitize everything. That's what this culture has become like. We want to sanitize everything and bring it all down to the level of a baby. Now what you're doing is you're ensuring no one can ever really learn how not to do something when you do that. Okay? So this fear of chaos needs to go if we're going to be free. And again, that's what the control system is all about through the propaganda media. They want to constantly pump all the things you should be afraid of. See, when I talk about the negative, I don't sit there and tell you you should be deeply afraid about this. It's not fear porn. It's not fear mongering. It's what's actually taking place that you need to be aware of and get streetwise about. Then you need to get involved in changing the dynamic through knowledge, through knowing what the causal factor that led to that condition is and then reversing it. That's how you add a different polarity. I tell people what's like, you know, uh, drying clothes, right? You put your clothes in the washer and they're soaking wet when you take them out. Are you going to dry them by pouring more water on them? No. Only an insane person would think so. You have to add the opposite polarity. So are you going to possibly be able to create freedom by remaining in a state of fear? Even the fear of chaos, it's not possible. Because we saw what fear does. Understanding why chaos gets manifested is different than being afraid of it. I'm not afraid of chaos. Because I know the underlying causal reasons of how it gets created. Okay? It may still be created because a lot of other people are still in ignorance of those laws of manifestation. That means all I can do is try to teach people how it gets made. That's the only way I can try to avert it, is to bring them that knowledge. I can't make them take it. They have to want it. And I'm telling you, we need to be the carriers of that knowledge, whether people want to hear it or not. That is a masculine principle of getting involved and taking the truth to others as we're going to come to. <laughs> the fear of chaos is bullshit and needs to be shed. Okay? Let's correct this deception of, hey, we should be in constant fear of chaotic results or consequences. In the ancient world, there was a concept that was taught of the two teachers. And again, names aren't as important. Okay, The concept is what's important. Two feminine teachers. Two goddesses, actually. You had the goddess of truth, justice, natural law, morality, the understanding of the difference between right and wrong, the sword of truth, the scales of justice, all of that. Okay? She was called a million different things. Doesn't, the name is not important. You know, you could get into uh, Diana in the Roman tradition. You can get into Ba'at in the ancient Egyptian tradition. Semiramis in the, in the uh, you know, Sumerian and Babylonian traditions. Doesn't matter what the name was. In the, in the I believe it was the uh, upper Egyptian tradition, she was called Isis. Okay? She was a goddess, again, who nurtured the masculine dynamic of right action because she was the spiritual knowledge and she was a non-aggression principle the sacred feminine beautiful conceptual idea beautifully symbolically portrayed well, we have to understand not a real individual okay a symbolic goddess okay here's she's almost always depicted in green and she was all, almost always depicted as holding the child that she bore into the world which was right action as gold so you see the green hue for the goddess and the golden hue for the child the golden child of right action spiritual gold is right behavior in the world and green again is the color of the heart which the goddess represents Okay, so Isis, if you went to her law and you understood it and you integrated it, 
That's how you learn how to avert chaos. You would receive the positive manifestation of the knowledge of natural law, morality, which is order and goodness and freedom. However, if you refuse the teachings of ISIS, y'all were going to be taught anyway. You were going to be taught anyway. Because there's, it's a dialectic that's real. See? The, the polarizing choice here, you only have two options when it comes to natural law. You either learn and get the good manifestation, or you ignore and get the bad manifestation. And just understand, it's a computer program. Natural law is a computer program. You hit the key number one, you get this result on the screen of life. You hit key number two, you get the opposite result on the screen of life. The end. And there ain't a damn thing you can do about it. Okay? You have free will which key to press. That's where your free will comes in. But you have no free will when it comes to what you get after you press the key. Then you get what you get because the button's pushed. And a program controls that. Nobody wants to look at it that way. That God is law. Period. And it's unwavering. It works that way 100% of the time, flawlessly. So, what there's nothing wrong with is the way these laws of manifestation are working. Zero perfection. Absolute perfection. What's wrong is us. We're the retarded child that keeps putting its hand on the stove and burning it endlessly, unfortunately. We don't want to learn from ISIS. So we will learn from Eris. And Eris is a damn good teacher. I love Eris just as much as Isis. I love them both equally. There's nothing to fear from Eris. You just have to understand, it's a computer program. It works the same way, flawlessly, 100% of the time, at all times and places. So Eris was the goddess of chaos, pain, and disorder. Okay? She was called by other names. Greek tradition, Discordia was one of her manifestations. You had a slightly masculine version uh, in the uh, uh, older Egyptian kingdom tradition. It was a, a crocodile being. It was um, uh, uh, Amit, okay? uh, a chaotic god. But Eris was probably her best known incarnation all right, in the ancient world. And when you refused the teachings of Isis, you went into the arms of the goddess of chaos. And then she learned your real good. Again, chaos is not something that should be feared. It is a teacher. It is how we learn what not to do. Again, let me temper this by saying that doesn't mean you want to go into the dynamic of chaos and stay there in a trap where you continue to do the wrong thing over and over again endlessly. You know what that's called? That's called hell, which is where humanity is at. Hell. Okay? A place with infinite potential that could become the kingdom of heaven. We've turned it into hell. We've turned it into a prison. The, the creator of the universe says, hey, there's a contract. You're going to go into the physical world, free will, you create whatever you want. Whatever you want. Really? Whatever we want? Whatever you want. Anything, anything's possible. Anything's possible. What do you want to create? Let's create a prison. Let's create hell. Let's create a prison. And let's go in there and keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. You know? That's madness. That's extremity. Imbalanced extremity. Not learning from chaos is what the extreme is. You know, I tell this little anecdote. Cousin of mine put his hand right on a hot stove after he was warned that stove is hot. You can't see a physical thing, but you see the color because it was one of those electric stoves. Barb was cooking some eggs in a pan. She moved the pan for a second to take it off the flame to go get some peppers to put in. He comes along. His parents are still sleeping. They were staying at the house we were at. She says, he goes, what's that? It's a very, very hot stove. Don't go near it. 
you'll get burned. He's like seven, eight years old, seven, seven years old, something like that. Never was burned in his life. Didn't even know what she really meant by the experience of being burned. So he wanted to find out. And he found out. Luckily, not too bad, but he found out with second degree burns on a couple of his fingers that blistered up. You know, almost third, not quite, but, you know, when you start getting charred flesh, that's third. It was definitely second degree burns. You know, real, real red and blistered skin. Okay? Uh, he won't touch that stove again, though. The lesson was learned, right? Through pain. That's the role of chaos. If we don't learn the lesson, then we have an integrated the understanding of what chaos is for, and we're stuck in an extremity of repeating chaos and getting chaotic results over and over again through our ignorance. That's out of control and balance. I'm not telling you that kind of chaos is anything that should be desired. I'm saying this kind of chaos where you make a mistake, you immediately see the consequences of your mistake, and then you rectify it by not doing that again is a positive form of chaos that shouldn't be feared. And unfortunately, most people think that we have to stay in a system of slavery to somehow prevent chaos from manifesting. When in fact, it's impossible to do that because chaos and slavery are the same thing. You know, we got to maintain a government because without it, there would be chaos. No, it's actually just the opposite. There's chaos when you have external government. That is the condition of chaos because it's the condition of slavery. The control and slavery system are, is all about the limitation of free will. See, that's the gift of the creator, and that's what the opposer wants to destroy. Is that which we've been gifted by the creator. Whatever you think of that force as. And that's none of my business. That's your business. But that gift of free will, the most precious gift we've ever been given, the, the adversary wants it. He wants to destroy it. That's what the control and slavery system is all about. And they do that through the destruction of possibilities in our lives. When you are destroying possibility, you're destroying freedom, you're destroying order. That's what man's laws are all about. We're going to insulate everybody from these possibilities. And therefore, we're going to have a totally robotic programmed society that's totally under control. True freedom includes infinite possibility, which by definition includes the possibility for chaos. This possibility, the possibility that chaos may result, that we may get a manifested result of chaos by making a mistake and doing that which is wrong, okay, cannot be feared. Because if we're in that level of fear, even of that possibility, what are we getting? Ignorance, confusion, control, slavery, chaos. Okay? When fear is present, that's what happens. So if we're ever to be go going to be truly free, what we do have to eradicate is the fear of the possibility of chaos. Which I have completely eradicated in myself. I can say that truly. I do not fear chaos. I don't live my life in a state of fear of what might happen. I tell people, give me my battle rifle and I'll take my chances. I'd rather live my life in 100% dangerous freedom than 100% safe slavery. Thank you very much. We've got to shed that fear of chaos if we're going to be truly free. I say embrace chaos. Again, that small-scale version of chaos. Don't embrace the kind of chaos we're trapped in now. Endlessly repeating cycles that you know we don't learn from. That's high-level cosmic chaos, which is really rebellion against all of creation, to be honest. That shouldn't be embraced. We have to embrace the possibility that small levels of chaos could happen in uh, at a low level within society because we're free to you know, do what we want and even experiment and make mistakes. That has to be understood. Then we learn from the mistakes and we don't repeat them. 
Right now, we're not in a position where we can even barely learn from our mistakes because all of these, this endless control and endless erection of laws to govern everything, what it does is it takes away the possibility to even make mistakes and learn from them. That's why man's law is a total roadblock, roadblock to the understanding of truth and natural law. It's trying to sanitize everything through control, which is ultimately creating nothing but slavery, which is more chaos. See this thing? It won't work out. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine a society without laws, man's law. I can't imagine a society without money. I hear this from people constantly. How would that work out? Well, you know what? Maybe it wouldn't. Who's to say it would have to? But you know what? Chaos on the, that smaller level would be a lot better than the cosmic chaos we have going on as a result of keeping this slavery system in place. Like I said, I'll take cannibals on every street corner and give me my AK and, and let me go. You know? That's it. That's certainly not a new age approach, I know that. <laughs> but if that's what manifested, maybe that needs to be cleaned up. Maybe we need to go clean in house on psychopaths. You know? And maybe that would be the right thing to do. But my point here is, if we fear the possibility of the manifestation of chaos, what that actually equates to is the fear of true freedom. Anybody who says, I fear that because chaos might result if we do that, what you are really saying is, I'm afraid of freedom. And the fear of freedom is strong in the human species. The fear of real freedom. We have, the, the concept of freedom we have is a word. It's a word. Humanity has never been free. Ever. That's what we have to work toward. And we're not getting it done the way we're doing it. You know, they say insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. That's where we're at when it comes to trying to create freedom. What we are doing isn't working. Because we can't get people on the same page regarding the connection between morality and freedom. It has nothing to do with religion. It's a science. It's a science of how the laws of nature govern everything. Not just physical realities. Not just dynamics. When I let that go, what happens to it? The laws of nature govern more than that. They govern what happens to our free will behavioral decisions. Which is what natural law is. So, this idea of, I can't imagine how that could work out. Because there's people that think that if there was no rulers, there'd be no rules. You know what? You can't do anything to nullify the rules. Nobody here or anywhere else put the rules that govern this reality into effect. You know what put that into effect? Creation itself. Or you could say the creator of the universe, or you could say God, or you could say the underlying force of intelligence that, that underlies all physical manifested reality. I don't care what you call it. It's the same force. And no man, no woman, no group of beings on this planet or any other put that force into manifestation. Creation did that. So when people say, I can't imagine how that would work out without rules, there's no such thing as a time, place, circumstance, event, anything without rules, ever. There are always rules. That doesn't mean that there needs to be rulers. Rules being in effect that govern things according to natural laws are 100% different than having people who rule over other people. We're talking about two totally different worlds here. The natural kind of rules is what creates and governs order if we live in harmony with them. The other kind, man's rules, only creates slavery. Because they're based in moral relativism. They're based on likes, preferences, whims of the legislators. They're not really based on what's right and true. You know, people want to believe that they are, but then you just look at the inherent contradictions. You know, how can I own a high-capacity magazine, okay, and I, I, I literally go 
two miles to the east of my present location, I could be thrown in a cage for a physical possession. Somebody could say, that's moral on this side of this imaginary line called a border, called a state border. You go two miles in this direction, we throw you in a cage for the same behavior. You know? Yeah. That's not moral relativism, though. That's not Satanism. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Man's law is Satanism because it's based in moral relativism. And moral relativism is the main ideological tenet of Satanism. We live in a Satanic society. What this really means, folks, is the death of the imagination. The force from which enlightenment only can burst forth. The philosopher's stone comes from the human imagination. You can't solve any problem if you cannot envision the problem going away. Until you can envision, yes, it is possible for me to create something different, and I have to envision that, and I have to imagine it. Then I need to do what's required to put that manifestation in place. Then guess what? Not only aren't you going to make that manifestation that you say you want come into being, it can't come into being. It can't manifest. It's impossible. And that's what you're doing when you mentally say to yourself, I can't imagine how that's going to work. You know what you do? You ensure that it can't ever occur. So you want a society based in freedom, and then you say, I can't imagine how freedom would work? You're part of the dynamic that's holding freedom back from manifesting. Actively. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're doing that at a conscious level or an unconscious one. You're contributing to that dynamic of failure. And that's caused by mind control, which is what the depth of the imagination is propagated by. Through their fear of the possibility of chaos, which the, 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 the fear of the possibility of chaos, right? Um, the possibility of chaos is true freedom. Being able to do things and see what expresses, including the possibility of something manifesting chaotically, is what freedom is. That's what freedom means. It doesn't mean you continue to choose the wrong thing if you get a chaotic result. In other words, true freedom includes the possibility of making mistakes. And if you fear that, okay, what the because people fear that. They're advocating the continuance of slavery and control. The legitimacy and the continuance of authority and government. So what they're doing by refusing to acknowledge that chaos may manifest if we have true freedom in place is you are ensuring that violence and slavery continue because you're advocating for the continuance of government and authority. So anybody that believes that authority is real, must exist, government is real, must exist, must continue, you are an advocate of slavery. Whether you understand that or not, it's unwaveringly, invariably, always true. Until you reverse that position. Then you would be a, a non-supporter of slavery. And these are the only two kinds of people that exist. So one real divide, as I call it. The one true divide as we'll get to. This meme here says, Satan is the most dangerous religion in the world, and it is a religion. Those who believe that authority is necessary and that it must continue have actually been duped into believing that human slavery is necessary and must continue in order to prevent chaos. Ladies and gentlemen, violence and slavery, which is what statism ultimately is, which is what government is, what it's all backed by, can not prevent chaos. You want to know why they can't prevent chaos? Because violence and slavery are chaos. We're in chaos now. Chaos is not being held back because government is in place and authority, quote-unquote, is in place. That's what has created the chaotic condition we are living in. Here's the one true divide I spoke about. There's only two kinds of people. And yeah, people are at different levels and expressions of consciousness. But ultimately, there's one criterion that divides humanity. 
that's real. It's not an illusory duality. It's a real duality. Okay? Illusory dualities is are what kind of slavery do you like? Do you like right wing slavery or left wing slavery? That's an illusory duality. It's all the same thing. An illusory duality is what kind of religious uh, slavery do you want? Do you want the, the Hindu variation? Do you want the uh, uh, fake Christian variation? You know, do you want the watered down Masonic Lodge system variation? Because they all lead to the same thing: more control, less understanding of natural law. You know, they're, they're not esoteric traditions that really convey deep truths about the laws of creation and manifestation. So all of these things, race, age, you know, political affiliation, all divide and conquer strategies by the controllers. They're not real dualities. We're one living dynamic family here on the earth. But there is one difference between the people of that family, and it is whether they believe in slavery and support it, or whether they know that slavery is illegitimate and do not support it. That's the real difference in human beings. So the supporters of slavery are the statists. Like I said, get as offended as you want. You believe in government, you're a supporter of slavery. The end, for all time, for all time, get as offended as you like. You believe government should exist, you are a supporter of slavery. Statism, the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, imprison, harass, steal from, and kill people so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, harass, steal from, and kill people. <laughs> uh, the logic is flawless, as you can see. <laughs> There's no contradiction there whatsoever. I was looking for an image to convey an anarchist, and you know, I was going to put maybe my picture up there, somebody like Larkin Rose, or you know, somebody from the freedom movement who really understands that statism and government is inherently illegitimate. And I figured, nah, it's a little bit too egoic. So I found this meme on Facebook. You know, Christ pointing to the Sacred Heart and saying, "Well, I'm an anarchist, but unfortunately, most of my followers are statists. You know, people who think you can serve two masters. Oh yeah, I, I want to serve the truth and the God of creation, and I'm also going to believe in the authority of man. Yeah, that there's no contradiction there either with religionists, and and they condone and support that. You know what they're called? I call them chinos. C h i n o s. Chinos. C H is Christian, I is is, N is name, and O is only. Christians in name only. Chino. Because <laughs> that's all, it's just a label. They have no idea what real Christianity, esoteric Christianity is. You know, you got you got Minos, they're Buddhists in name only. You know, you have uh, Minos, those are Muslims in name only. We have other Minos too, those are Masons in name only. You know? What they are is a joke. They're a joke. Who don't know anything about the true esoteric underlying teachings of any of their traditions. And they claim that they embody those, those teachings. When they're ignorant fools who believe a storyline, a cover story, about astrotheology or some lodge system allegory that they never even looked at or understood or some symbolism they don't understand. They've never gotten the real teaching, which is natural law, the laws of morality, the real law of attraction. You know? They wear a label and name only. They're nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. So this meme fulfilled the role, as far as I'm concerned, because I think the figure of Christ, again, historicity aside, regardless of what you believe about the actual being, the figure of the Christ, the, the archetype, is the ultimate anarchist. He fought against the religious entrenched institutions of his day in the form of the Pharisees and Sadducees in the story of the New Testament. He fought against the, the entrenched financial system of the day the money changers, the bankers of his time, right? When he did that, that's what got him in trouble because they had so much power and influence over the Roman Empire, the existing government, the state. And they all together came together in a conspiracy and put him to death. So see, people, the people in this religion don't understand Christ was at war against religion, money, and government. 
all false religions because people aren't worshipping or paying homage to the true God of creation when they believe in those nonsense false religions. No, they're all false gods, false idols. Has nothing to do with the God of creation. And they, they, Christians can't see that simple allegory in their own scripture that that's who the Christ figure was at war with. Ultimate spiritual warrior. So there's only one divide. You're either a statist, in which case you support slavery, or an anarchist, in which case you know slavery is always illegitimate. I'm going to explain the term anarchy, because most people hear it and are like, oh, oh, doesn't that mean chaos? No, that's called mind control, ladies and gentlemen. It's called mind control through the obfuscation of the meaning of a word through endless repetition. If I keep telling you, this is a hammer, this is a hammer, this is a hammer, this is a hammer, and it's really a remote control. If I tell you that from the minute you're born, you start believing this is a hammer after you're able to speak. If I teach a baby this device, hammer, 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 that baby's going to eventually grow up thinking this is a goddamn hammer. <laughs> what they've done with the word anarchy to convince you that it means chaos because you don't know where words came from look, you, people really need to go get a Latin reader a Latin dictionary, go on Amazon get a Latin reader, get a Greek reader study the Greek alphabet you'll, you'll start transliterating with it learning the sounds I took years of Latin and Greek and it's the best education I've ever gotten because if you don't know the meaning of the words you speak, somebody can tell you that they mean something that means absolutely nothing what they really do. And that's what they've done with the word anarchy. The word anarchy comes from Greek. The Greek prefix a or an means without the absence of or the negation of. Similar to ne in Latin. Okay? And the Greek noun archon which means ruler or master, as in ruler over subjects or masters over slaves. In that context, not a self-master, self-governing being, no. Archon meant, I rule you. You are my property. I'm the archon, I'm the master, and you are my slave. That's what the archon means in Greek, okay? Anarchy, when you put those together, an archon means without rulers, ruler or rulers. Now, I wrote on a chalkboard, no rulers, no masters, no rulers over anybody else. Let's say I wrote those phrases on a chalkboard. I said, go up there and you write one word that defines that in one word. 99.9% .9 of people would go up and write the word freedom on the board word association game. But then if I write the word anarchy, which is what that phrase means, okay, they write down the word chaos. They've tried to convince you that without masters or rulers, chaos results. And what I'm trying to tell you is it's exactly the opposite. With masters and rulers, you're in a state of chaos already. Because that's called slavery, and slavery is chaos. And slavery is always illegitimate, and always morally wrong, and needs to be ended. Anarchy does not mean without rules. There is no such thing as a state of existence without rules, because natural law is always in effect, and can never be changed by any 3D being in this entire universe. There are always rules and there always will be. And man is not the lawmaker. He is not the maker of rules. The creator is the maker of rules. And we believe we are that force. As a people. We believe our law is somehow binding and just when it's enslaving and based in moral relativism. And that's what the satanic force wants to do. It wants to be God. That's what we're up against. Psychopaths who want to be God. Okay? Make no mistake about it. 
So anarchy doesn't mean without rules. It means without rulers, without masters. That's what the word actually means. No rulers, no masters, or in other words, real freedom. True freedom is anarchy. The state of not being ruled, not being enslaved. I like to call it anarchani. Anarchani. Because the whole word archon is in that. And that means the negation of the archons. The archons are illegitimate. Rulers are illegitimate. Masters over other people are illegitimate. Anarchani means you've eradicated that condition. But you know, even that's a euphemism. We could call the statist the archonist, the one who believes in the masters, believes the masters legitimately rule over their slaves, right? But we could call the, anar the anarchist, the anarchonist, right? Strange words, I know. Most people have never seen words written like that. But really, that describes what these people are in this one true divide. But see, even those are euphemisms. To, to really cut through the bullshit and say what these people really are, I just like to word it like this. These people support slavery. These people oppose slavery. I proudly consider myself an opposer of all forms of slavery. When people ask me, what do you do? What, what's your website about? I don't tell them, oh, it's all about consciousness, natural law, the laws of morality. No, because they, they get glassy-eyed, they shut down. I say, my website is about slavery and how to end it. <laughs> and then I get their attention. Because <laughs> that's what it's about. Bridging the divide to all the anarchists, to all the statists, to all the supporters of slavery in this world. Thank you. I have one thing to say. I, for one, will willingly choose true freedom, even if it meant that roads may lo no longer exist. You know, the Marodes crowd, right? <laughs> if, even if roads don't exist in a post-slavery world, even if it means that murderers and cannibals might lurk around every corner, even if it means I might drown in human waste because there'd be no sanitation, even if it meant my home might collapse because of unsafe building standards, or that it might spontaneously burst into flame at any given moment, hey, how about there's cannibals lurking around every street corner? Okay? Even if my, flame, my home burst into flame, nobody came to put out the fire. That's all right. I'll choose true freedom. Thank you. I'll choose to live in total danger and be truly free than to exist in so-called safety and be a slave. An understanding and acceptance of true freedom means letting go of the fear of the possibility of chaos. As long as people stubbornly cling to this fear, they're ultimately enslaving themselves because slavery is generated and perpetuated through fear, as we saw in the natural law expressions. Only when we stop being afraid can we even begin to imagine what it means to truly be free. New Age Deception 12, 12, all you need is love. And I took a little pot shot at the Beatles in the, uh, nothing is real, you know, the section on everything's an illusion. You know, strawberry fields, nothing is real. Taking another one here with uh, all you need is love, because it's not true. Not in the sense that a lot of these people are using this term, which equates to the romantic notion of love, or even the familial or platonic version of love, which isn't the, how I'm defining love in my work. I'm defining it as the force which expands consciousness to accept truth. Love and truth are one. So again, what this does in the New Age context is it emphasizes emotion over knowledge and action. That's that sacred feminine imbalance without the sacred masculine to counterbalance it. And it's bullshit because much more is required than just love. Namely, things like knowledge, courage, willpower, persistence, a deep understanding of causal factors? No, you don't hear the New Age movement talking about those. Just emotional, heart-based qualities. 
which are very important and are not to be de-emphasized, but they have to be balanced with the head and the guts. There's three centers that create change. The heart is very important, probably the most important, but the mind and the courage centers are two equally important components. Moving toward the extremes of either polarity, of either intellect, which is left brain imbalance, or emotion, which is right brain imbalance, can act as a divisive force which holds us back from true care and right action. We must engage our willpower at an individual level to unite these two seemingly polarizing forces, the head and the heart. When we do that, that's when real courage and right action are born. See, you gotta look at it as a seesaw. You know, this this balance needs to be struck. You can't have an imbalance one way or another, or you're gonna fall into either master think or slave think. Knowledge, courage, willpower, and right action, in addition to true care, must be equal, balanced parts of the equation of higher consciousness. We have to bring them together to unite them. That's when real courage to change the world is born, as embodied by a single individual willing to stand in front of a row of tanks because of the injustices that were taking place. You know? There's a role model. There's an example. That's the heart and the head combined that gives birth to that kind of action. That's called knowing what's going on and caring. Deception number 13, enlightenment is only about changing yourself. One of my biggest pet peeves in the whole New Age community. It's all about just individually in changing yourself. Once you change yourself, that's enlightenment and it's okay. Well, enlightenment's a shared experience, ladies and gentlemen. Your own little pinpoint of light isn't going to do so well if the whole world is full of darkness. So it is our shared responsibility to educate our fellow man. See, and the end goal of enlightenment should be to feel good all the time. That's what I call feel-good spirituality. There's nothing balanced. There's nothing tempered. It's all about, I'm going to live for my deepest desires and try to live the best personal fulfillment possible about what I want to achieve and what I want to get and what I want to own. People think that's enlightenment somehow. You know? It's not about service to self. It's not about feeling good. The most enlightened people in this world right now don't feel very good about what they see, about what is happening. You know, you're probably much more likely to be an enlightened person if you're pretty damn upset about what's going on here on Earth right now. Just worrying about yourself and thinking that enlightenment's only about you and what you want to get out of things is bullshit. It's not what real enlightenment's about, folks. Enlightenment is about service and responsibility to truth above and above all else, all other modalities, even service to others. The truth of the current human condition should make you feel uncomfortable at this time. It's not something. See, I heard once at I think it was. Um, I think it was a lecture by um, some father of uh, an actor. Um, Barb and I went to it. He knows the Dalai Lama, this guy. I can't remember his name. He's a big proponent of Buddhism. And he said, to me, enlightenment is the ultimate form of tolerance for other people's cognitive dissonance. And I heard that, and I'm like, what, really? You think in light, to be enlightened is to look at other people and their internal contradictions in their own consciousness, saying they believe one thing and really doing another or supporting a different thing, and saying to be enlightened is to be completely tolerant of that level of ignorance. That's the exact opposite of enlightenment. The exact opposite of what it actually is. Real enlightenment is to do the work to bring light to the darkness. And that's the hardest work there is to do. Which is why so few do it. That's the hardest work to do. To 
morally educate your ignorant fellow beings. And that's why no one wants to get involved in that real great work. We have to use this discomfort in what we see in the world to motivate ourselves to create real change in the world through our actions, the sacred masculine action. We have to seek the truth, then speak the truth to all within our, the range of our voice. You got to take it in, then let it flow back out. See, this is this is what people who are really engaged in trying to spread the truth feel like right now, and that's okay. See, that's why nobody wants to join us in the fight. They don't want to be that guy. Well, you know, I'll be that guy proudly. That's fine. Because I'm still standing in the truth even if I'm a minority of one. No problem. <clears throat> it is our shared responsibility at this time to help awaken others by continuously speaking the truth unapologetically even if we feel burdened by that task and even if it makes all of those involved feel uncomfortable. This isn't about comfort, folks. Enlightenment's not about comfort. Sorry to burst the new age, the new cage bubble on this. Okay? That's not what enlightenment is about, feeling good all the time. This is namby-pamby, feel-good spirituality, which has nothing to do with real spirituality. Pseudo-spiritualism is what I call that. Carl Jung, a modern alchemist, said, One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. That latter procedure, however, is highly disagreeable and therefore not popular. People don't want to get involved in what's known as the true great work. The true great work to enlighten our fellow ignorant beings. To bring the knowledge that can dispel that level of darkness and ignorance. Because that's the hardest work there is to do. What is the true great work? It is the arduous task of influencing others to awaken to the truth. It is to help them to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority and government, or man's law, that they have actually been supporting and condoning the legitimacy of slavery. And that they have been immoral for having done that and have, having taken that position. It's dragging them away from their former false religion into un the uncharted territory of truth. Once again, the calcified ego doesn't want to go into that uncharted territory. It wants to stay in its nice, safe cage. In short, what the true great work comes down to is to help people to abandon their false religions, the erroneous and dogmatic belief systems which hold back the progress of human consciousness by impeding the reception of truth and natural law, which is what all religion is there to do. You want to know what the true great work is in two words? That all of the spiritual warriors incarnated on this planet at this time, that's why the population is so high. So many people wanted to come here and incarnate here at this time and place to make a difference. And they get involved in the battle, in the spiritual battlefield where the action is taking place in this corner of the cosmos. Spiritual warriors come to do one mission to end slavery on this world. And like I said, the New Age movement and other religions derailed the mission. Derailed the mission. New Age deception number 14. A savior is coming to rescue us any day now. You know, I put the image of Christ in there are many positive positions. Here's a negative one because people think that Christ was telling us, I'm here to be worshipped and I'm going to be your savior. People are deluded. He was trying to explain to people, you want to be free? You got to have knowledge. Know the truth, then you'll be set free. Knowledge is the pathway to truth. And then right action that follows that knowledge. Putting it into application. He wasn't telling anybody to worship him or be, let him be their savior. He's telling people, here's an example I'm going to set with knowledge and right action. You follow that, you'll be alright. Don't, don't worship me. Live like that. Be that. Be it. 
then freedom will, will follow organically. Savior's coming to rescue us any day now, yeah. So here's my question. What Savior is your flavor? You like chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, butter, pecan? You know? Which flavor do you like? Oh, we got lots. We have so many. So many to choose from. You know, we have Christ. We have Buddha, of course. We have Horus. There's Horus, the Egyptian sun god Savior, yeah. After which the Christ uh, astrotheology uh, myth was patterned. 2,000 year, year, years older than Christ, but all the same story, the whole same story, you know? Oh, we have Mithra, the Mithraic tradition of Persia, the, the sun king who conquers the bull. Uh, absolute great choice, great flavor there. Oh, how about Kukul Khan of the Mayan tradition? What about, what about Lord Krishna of the Indus Valley coming to rescue us any day? How about Zoroaster of Persia? of the Zoroastrian tradition, you know? Old tablets of Babylonia, great choice, you know? Oh, maybe you're not a traditional flavor type person. Maybe you want the modern gurus and the modern, uh, you know, new age teachers. We have uh, the Maharishis, the yogis. We have, we even have the uh, the actual total fake variant like uh, Kumari here, you know? <laughs> Great documentary about being the guru yourself, actually. You know, this guy fakes being a new age guru. Teaches people a whole bunch of bunk. They graft onto him like a religion. And then he tells people, I was a fraud. I was just trying to tell you, you need to go within, discover the truth, understand things, be your own leader, be your own guru. You know? And some people love him for it. Some people hated him and didn't want to speak to him. But cool documentary. There's my other pot shot at the Beatles. Some people say, oh, they didn't really worship Maharishi or consider them their guru and they just got a number. Whatever. The whole point is, we don't need people to act as intercessors for us. We need to go and seek this knowledge and take it into ourselves and do something with it in a practical way with our feet on the ground, balanced. Hey, how about the political saviors? Plenty of people believe in them. They, you know, even their photographers, they take these pictures with some kind of circular object behind their head like a halo, as if they're going to rescue you from, from our own ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, two sides of the same coin right there. Anybody that believes otherwise, they're really frauded out. You know, they, they bought a big one there. <laughs> Oh, and now we have the extraterrestrial variant for those who are really non-traditional. -tradi you know, we got the Pleiadians. They're coming. Their starship's a little late. And that's having a problem with the warp drive. Oh, the Syrians. That's a good choice. Yeah. Oh, the Arcturians. Yeah, a little farther away, but they're on their way too. And my personal favorite, you know, the Andromedans. You know, coming in from another galaxy through that wormhole. They're running a little late, but they're going to be here. You know? And hey, listen, if you don't like either of these specific races, you know, then we have things like Ashtar Command. It's a big conglomeration. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, please say all with me together. The Galactic Federation of Lights! Yeah! Alright! Yeah! Mm -hmm. Can't wait to get involved now. Can't wait to get involved to rescue an ignorant species from themselves. They can't wait. They're chomping at the bit. They're tripping over themselves. See, that's probably what it is. It's such a race that there's collisions involved with so many of them are trying to get you so fast. You know, that's what it is, really. You know, so it's no fault of their own uniqueness. <laughs> can anybody that's still trapped in that, I mean, I don't know how much I could tell, tell people that they're a child. It's so childish, it's ridiculous. All right? Uh, let's correct this one. The correction is, there's the real savior. It's Jesus with the M4 rifle. <laughs> Obviously, not really. I think Jesus is more of an AK type of guy myself, but you know, that's me. Uh, he likes the collection of cop platform, what can I say? Um, no, for, seriously now, though, really, again, 
the only thing that's going to save us is knowledge of truth. And that was, that was the prescription of all of these teachers. They all said, essentially, know the truth, and the truth will set us free. They said, you go into yourself, you bring out the truth that lies within, you let that manifest, and you're going to create order. You don't want to do that deep introspective work of going into the self, doing some deep introspection, doing some deep study, understanding the laws that govern reality, you're going into bondage. The real spiritual teachers taught that same basic message. And that was also a message of natural law. So the answer ultimately does lie within, with our own personal responsibility to choose right action over wrong action through our own enlightenment in understanding the difference between right and wrong behavior. That's what conscience is. Okay? There's the device that's going to show you the Savior, right there. And religionists will get crazy nuts about that. I, re I realize that. Okay? Because they want to all externalize our power. All the power lies right here to create the change that we want to see. It does not involve in externalizing your power to any guru, deity, or extraterrestrial race. Last deception truth doesn't need to be defended. Okay? You hear this constantly. Just let the truth speak for itself. You don't need to defend it. Utter nonsense because the truth is barraged on all sides continuously by mind control and by deception everywhere we turn. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? That voice of deception and mind control is speaking nonstop, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 and a quarter days a year perpetually. It never stops. And we're barely getting started. You know? The truth is like this tiny whisper going on in the corner of the room when the big, loud house, you know, PA system is blaring trance music all over the place. You know? The voice of the truth needs to grow a lot louder. A lot louder. That means more people have to step into their courage and start speaking it. We need to make this a bullshit-free zone by confronting people on their bullshit. See, that's the deception. You don't need to defend the truth, so never confront anyone on their bullshit. That in itself is bullshit. In and of itself, that concept is bullshit. Of course truth needs defending. It doesn't have a voice to defend itself. We need to be its voice. We're the vehicles by which the truth operates in the 3D realm. Great meme here by Hodgel, that which can be destroyed by truth should be. Absolutely, truth is a combative force. It wages war against mind control and deception. That's how I started this seminar. So we're the, we're the vehicles for truth if we decide to take up her mantle and wage that spiritual battle. Because the truth is not going to do it by itself. We don't want to do that. It's going to get drowned out. So we need to make the earth a bullshit-free zone. And don't apologize for it. I don't apologize for anyone I may have offended. Don't apologize for any inconvenience. The truth is the truth. It remains the truth no matter how it is received or not received. If you know that you're standing in truth, speak it. Speak it unapologetically. Never apologize for knowing what is right. Ever. The universe is spoken into existence. And you know what? The ones with the loudest, the most dominant, the most persistent voice are going to be the one who propagates their value system. Whether it's a true value system or whether it's an erroneous, false, so-called value system. That's why evil and chaos are winning in the world. Because too many people are shut down and can't step into their courage to use their willpower to speak truth at all times and places. It is true that truth can never be destroyed. I'm telling you, even if we fail, truth will still exist and prevail ultimately because it cannot be overturned and undone. That can only happen within our little pocket, our little experience. But you know what? <laughs> we, as 3D beings, can be destroyed. 
And that only happens when we refuse to be the voice of truth and speak it and defend it when necessary. Never ever give up. Willpower is required. Persistence is required. This isn't going to be easy. It's an uphill battle. I'm not here to lie to you and tell you it'll be easy. Okay? We have to rage against the world of darkness that we're in. Never accept ignorance. Never accept darkness. Never accept evil. Wage war on it. It should be resisted. Resistance to evil is the victory of the truth. We need to be resistant to the things that are wrong and stand in what is right firmly with our feet firmly on the ground operating as spiritual beings within the physical dimension. A different reality can be spoken into existence by us, but only if we care enough to learn the truth and then develop the courage and the willpower to take right action to defend the truth at all costs. we got to get out of the cul-de-sac, folks. We can't continue to be this hamster on the wheel going nowhere. We have to open ourselves up to the reception of truth and natural law and live in that light. Not just talk about it or say it's all about a feeling. No, it's about action. The sacred masculine. When we do that, we'll break our chains of bondage. We'll end slavery on this planet as was our original spiritual mission as spiritual warriors before religion and the New Age movement took us off that course as a whole. And a new world can come into view. One that is based in truth, love, and freedom. If we step into that role of defenders of truth. That's an individual free will choice. No one can make you do it. You can only choose it or not choose it. Well, I say choose that truth and break our chains. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.